Hello, good morning, and welcome. My name is Dan Evans, and as the designated federal official for NASA's Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Independent Study Team, I'd like to call this meeting to order and introduce the panelists. In the back row, we have Nadia Drake, Paula Bontempi, Federica Bianco, David Grinspoon, Carlin Toner, Josh Sameta, and Jennifer Buss. Well, in the front row, we have Walter Scott, Warren Randolph, Reggie Brothers, Shelley Wright, Scott Kelly, Anna Maria Barea, Mike Gold, and David Spurgle, who serves as chair of the team. It's disheartening to note that several of them have been subjected to online abuse due to their decision to participate on this panel. And NASA's security team is actively addressing this issue. We at NASA are acutely aware of the considerable public interest in UAP. However, it's critical to understand that any form of harassment towards our panelists only serves to detract from the scientific process, which requires an environment of respect and openness. Now, every member of our team is a recognized authority in their respective field, and they have our unequivocal support. NASA stands in solidarity with them, advocating for a respectful discourse that befits their expertise and the significance of their work. Thanks. Now, in recent years, the subject of unidentified aerial phenomena, nowadays termed unidentified anomalous phenomena, or UAPs, has captured the attention of the public, the scientific community, and the government alike. And it's now our collective responsibility to investigate these occurrences with the rigorous scientific scrutiny that they deserve. NASA Administrator Senator Bill Nelson believes that understanding UAPs is vital for several reasons, which is why he directed this study. First and foremost, it provides an opportunity for us to expand our understanding of the world around us. As an organization dedicated to exploring the unknown, this work is in our DNA. Secondly, this study aims to enhance situational awareness. The presence of UAPs raises concerns about the safety of our skies, and it's this nation's obligation to determine whether these phenomena pose any potential risks to airspace safety. By understanding the nature of UAPs, we can ensure that our skies remain a safe space for all. In order to achieve these goals, it is crucial that we employ a scientific lens for our UAP work. It's precisely this rigorous, evidence-based approach that allows one to separate fact from fiction. This team is comprised of experts from various disciplines, which allows them to approach this work from multiple perspective. And we have greatly benefited from that collective expertise. Now, why do we value a scientific approach? It's because science is built on evidence. It thrives on scrutiny. It demands reprodu reprodu uh, reproducibility, reproducibility, uh, I can't, sorry, and above all, objectivity. When we approach UAPs from a scientific perspective, we do not come in with an agenda. We come in needing a roadmap. Indeed, the primary objective of this incredible team of experts is not to go back and look at grainy footage of UAPs, but rather to give us a roadmap to guide us for future analysis. And this is the very scientific method that NASA holds true to its heart. Scientific research is intended to be publicly available and transparent, and NASA prides itself on making its data and images available to the public to learn and explore on their own. By holding public meetings like this one, we aim for open and honest dialogue with the public. We recognize that public interest in UAPs is high and that the demand for answers is strong. Conversations like this one are the first step to reducing the stigma surrounding UAP reporting. Moreover, transparency is essential for fostering trust between NASA, the public, and the scientific community. In order to do things right, we must work together pulling our resources, our knowledge, and our expertise. And by maintaining open channels of communication, we can facilitate collaboration, encourage the exchange of ideas, and ensure that our work is as robust as possible. Not only that, but our commitment to openness is in itself a reflection of NASA's commitment to scientific integrity. As an organization dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, it is NASA's responsibility to be honest and forthright 
and to follow the science. And by being transparent in our work, we uphold our dedication to scientific excellence. The meeting today represents the first deliberative actions that the team has taken. And so it's important to keep in mind that they still have several months of work ahead of them. Their final report will be released this summer, and we will publish it on our website. NASA believes that the study of unidentified anomalous phenomena represents an exciting step forward in our quest to uncover the mysteries of the world around us. By embracing a scientific lens, we ensure that our work is rigorous and reliable, and by valuing transparency and openness, we can foster trust and collaboration with the public. Simply put, this is why we do what we do. After this panel was convened, the National Defense Authorization Act, known as the NDAA, changed the A in UAP to be anomalous. Accordingly, this panel's remit was expanded to encompass not just aerial UAP. However, the majority of UAP sightings to date have been in the aerial domain. So it's fair to say that this panel's focus is on the aerial aspect of anomalous. And I want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in today to watch our first deliberative meeting of NASA's independent study team on evaluating and categorizing unidentified anomalous phenomena. Before I begin, though, I really do want to double down on Dan's words that it is really disheartening to hear of the harassment that our panelists have faced online, all because they're studying this topic. NASA stands behind our panelists and we do not tolerate abuse. Harassment only leads to further stigmatization of the UAP field, significantly hindering the scientific progress and discouraging others to study this important subject matter. Your harassment also obstructs the public's right to knowledge. Our panelists are leading experts in the scientific, aeronautics, and data analytics communities. We are very lucky to have them on board to share their invaluable insights to inform NASA on what possible data could be collected in the future and how it can be collected to help us better understand the nature of UAP. Hi, I'm David Spurgle. I'm the chair of the panel. And when I look at our chart, we have a lengthy chart, but at the high level summary of it is how can NASA contribute to understanding the nature of UAPs? And our role here is not to resolve the nature of these events, but rather to give NASA guidance to provide a roadmap of how it can contribute in this, in this area. Uh, after my opening remarks, we'll hear from Sean Kirkpatrick from the AARO. And it's the AARO that's charged with leading the whole of government UAP effort. And they've already issued some preliminary reports on some of the events. NASA's role is to use its unique capabilities and its role as a civilian agency interacting with the scientific community in an open and transparent manner. And, you know, as Dr. Fox emphasized, the Defense and intelligence agency data on UAP are often classified primarily because of how the data is collected, not because of what's in the data. If a camera on an F-35 took a picture of a bird, it's classified. If a spy satellite takes an image of a balloon, and we've had in the news some balloons recently, that data is classified. And that's because of a desire to not reveal our technical capabilities to other nations. NASA, on the other hand, operates in a mode where it's collecting data in the open. And the NASA data is available on websites and is well characterized. And because of NASA being the civilian agency studying air and space, it has a special role to play. And I see our charge primarily as helping identify for NASA ways it could play that role and contribute to understanding. We've gone through a preliminary data collection stage. And to summarize some of the things that we've learned, the current data collection efforts regarding UAPs are unsystematic and fragmented across various agencies, often using instruments uncalibrated for scientific data collection. And if I think about the data that people have out there, it's in many ways what we'd like to think of as citizen science. But again, it is uncalibrated data um, 
poorly characterized, not well curated. And we face, looking through this data, a significant background, a background of many of these events are commercial aircraft, civilian and military drones, weather and research balloons, military equipment, ionospheric phenomenon. We need to characterize how, th when, the date, when the date is taken, when it sees events like this first. The current existing data and eyewitness reports alone are insufficient to provide conclusive evidence about the nature and origin of, of every UAP event. They're often uninformative due to lack of quality control and data curation. To understand UAP better, targeted data collection, thorough data curation, and robust analyses are needed. Such an approach will help to discern unexplained UAP sightings, but even then there's no guarantee that all sightings will be explained. Another challenge in this area is what we call stigma. There's a real stigma among people reporting events. And despite NASA's extensive efforts to reduce this stigma, the origin of the UAPs remain unclear, and we feel many events remain unreported. Commercial pilots, for example, are very reluctant to report anomalies, and one of our goals in having NASA play a role is to remove stigma and get high quality data. Um, in fact, if I were to summarize in one line what I feel we've learned, it's we need high quality data. And this is not some, as a research scientist whose work has been primarily focused in cosmology, I would say the lesson of my career has been you want to address important questions. You need high quality data with well calibrated instruments. Looking at the release of data, very important for our study, when it's high quality. And you have also commented that data are not always perfect when we're doing certain studies. I wonder if you could um, shed some light on the, you know, the difference between the application of certain data to certain scientific challenges. So, you know, when you look at your camera, your camera is often designed to take an image in the daytime and might not be optimized for nighttime imaging. Or if you take something that uh, astronomers are very familiar with, is we design our telescopes to work at night. And if the sun is not even if you can, you know, you would never take the Hubble telescope and point it at the sun. This would destroy its detectors. Not only that, if the telescope is pointing there and the sun is over there, even though you're not looking at the sun, reflections off of the optics will produce what we call ghosting. And that kind of ghosting gets, produces some very strange images. And this, you know, one of the many things we need to worry about when we see unusual things taken from a camera is even if you're pointing the camera there, was the sun over there? Those kinds of anomalies degrade the quality of the data. And that's why it's very important to work with well-characterized instruments and to be, you know, using them in ways in which you, you, you understand what, what's going on. So I think if you look at you know, data taken from the James Webb telescope or from the Hubble or any of these things, and these are you know, telescopes looking out in space, you'll see some really, you know, at first, funny phenomenon. When a telescope points at a star that's bright, it saturates the detector and puts bleeding down the detector. And you'll see phenomenon like if there's a bright star off to the side of the, not, not, not even one you're looking at, you get this effects where light bounces off of dust in your telescope and produces a sort of diffuse image that has some really strange properties. So, you know, when you see something unusual, 
the first thing you have to do is understand how that data was taken. And I think this is one of the challenges one faces when you have data taken by uncalibrated instruments years ago. It's very hard to know what's taken. It's very hard to draw conclusions. I think that's one of the challenges with uh, archival data. And uh, I think having dedicated, well-calibrated instruments, I think, will be important here as in any other area to understand what's going on. So, David, anomalies are so often the engine of discovery. Maybe you could say a quick word about high-risk, high-reward research in your field of cosmology and how you see that impacting the UAP study as well. So um, an area that comes to mind is um, fast radio bursts. And the uh, uh, Shaw Prize was just announced yesterday and were awarded to the discovery of fast radio bursts. And these are these bursting signals that go off all over in space. And it's an interesting story because some of the bursts were real and are fascinating. And some of the bursts, there was a series of bursts observed by this observatory in Australia. And they had really strange structure. And people couldn't figure out what was going on. And then they started to notice a lot of them bunched together around lunchtime. And what had happened was the uh, people at the observatory would heat up their lunch in the microwave. And something they would do is they would open the door of the microwave oven before the uh, microwave stopped. This is bad for your microwave oven. <laughs> it wears it out. But not only that, it produced a burst of radio signal that was picked up by these sensitive detectors. So this, I think, is an interesting lesson. Some events end up being something unusual and conventional. But some events with these FRBs turn out to be these powerful explosions um, which are taking place at cosmological distances. Um, their nature is still not fully understood. Um, I think they're one of the really most fascinating objects we have, these bursts going out all over space. Um, they're interesting probes because they're kind of lighting up space between here and there. And they're a subject of very active research. And if I, you know, one looks at the history of these FRBs, at first they were discovered, not believed, then con finally confirmed, and they were discovered by instruments that were very sensitive but not optimized for this. And now what we're doing is we're optimizing instruments and optimizing software to look for these events. And it's often these surprises that turn out to be most interesting. And you know there are phenomena like sprites, which you can think of as upward going lightning, which were seen by commercial pilots and somewhat not believed, right? Because they were very strange. And, and it was really only when we were able to take very high speed imaging data, uh, data taken often from places like space station, that we were able to see that the, uh, and learn about these um, fascinating ionospheric phenomena. So it's, uh, surprises are really interesting. I mean, I think this is one of the, uh, fascinating things about the UAP phenomenon. If it's something that's anomalous, um, that makes it interesting and worthy of study. NASA has been an invaluable partner to our team at Aero as we work to better understand and respond to unidentified anomalous phenomena. We applaud NASA for commissioning its independent study team and for exploring what data and tools could be leveraged to shed greater light on UAP. Though NASA and Aero are taking on very different aspects of the UAP problem set, our efforts are very much complementary. We both are committed to the scientific method, to a data-driven approach, and the highest standards of scientific research integrity. While NASA is evaluating unclassified data sources for its study, Aero's data set includes classified material with a focus on national security areas. 
However, all of this data collectively is critical to understanding the nature and origin of UAP. NASA brings unique capabilities, world-class scientists, and a wealth of academic and research linkages. NASA also has access to Earth sensing satellites, radiological sensors, tools for gravitational wave, geomagnetic wave detection, and means for analyzing open source and crowdsourced data that may assist both Aero and NASA in their UAP efforts. We are very grateful for the partnership and welcome the opportunity to join with NASA to share our collective findings with the public as the U.S. government moves towards greater transparency on this issue. Last month, I testified before members of the Senate Armed Services Committee on emerging threats and capabilities and shared some of the progress made since Arrow's establishment in July 2022. I discussed Arrow's scientific and analytic approaches, its efforts to improve UAP data collection, standardize our reporting processes, leverage our partnerships, and meticulously review the U.S. government's UAP-related historical records. As I told the subcommittee then, the resolution of all UAP cases cannot be accomplished by DOD and the intelligence community alone. ERA's ultimate success will require partnerships with the interagency, industry, academia, the scientific community, and the public, which all bring their own resources, ideas, and expertise to the UAP challenge. We believe robust collaboration and peer review across a broad range of partners will promote greater objectivity and transparency in the study of UAP. Of course, NASA's UAP independent study team was convened very much in that spirit. I also emphasize to Congress that the only a very small percentage of UAP reports display signatures that could reasonably be described as anomalous. The majority of unidentified objects reported to Arrow and in our holdings demonstrate mundane characteristics of readily explainable sources. While a large number of cases in Arrow's holdings remain technically unresolved, this is primarily due to a lack of data associated with those cases, very much along the lines of what David was just speaking about. Without sufficient data, we are unable to reach defendable conclusions that meet the high scientific standards we set for resolution. Meanwhile, for the few objects that do demonstrate potentially anomalous characteristics, Arrow is approaching these cases with the highest level of objectivity and analytic rigor. This includes physical testing and employing modeling and simulation to validate our analyses and the underlying theories, and then peer reviewing those results before reaching any conclusions. Arrow has shared these cases with the appropriately cleared NASA team members in order to discuss and help recommend potential scientific areas of study that NASA may want to take lead on. I'll underscore here, as I did before Congress, that Arrow's work will take time if we are committed to doing it right. Arrow is committed to the highest standards of scientific research integrity, as we know our partners at NASA are as well. Thanks again to NASA for hosting this public forum for UAP discussion and information exchange. And I'd like to turn to a brief presentation that includes some recently declassified footage and trends uh, for discussion. Next slide, please. So some of you probably saw a version of this at the open hearing uh, last month. This is an overall uh, uh, review of all of the analytic trends of all the cases that we have to date. And while the numbers may have changed a little bit, uh, the overall trends remain the same. Most of what we are seeing reported uh, by aircraft are at the altitudes where we fly aircraft. That should not be a surprise. You will note, however, that I have no space reports and I have no maritime reports. That is notable, even though we are looking across all of those domains. On the upper right, we have UAP morphologies. The vast majority of what has been reported and what we have data on, a little less than half now, are orbs round spheres. And in the bottom right, you will see in the really the, the heat map of the areas where we get most of our reporting. This is very much a collection biased map. 
this is where our sensors are, our military and our IC and some of the FAA data. In the middle, which is what we call our typical UAP characteristics for the vast majority of the cases that we see. One way of looking at that is a, is a we'll call it a target package. This is the thing we are out hunting for in most cases. Next slide, please. This is an example of one that I showed at the hearing recently. Uh, this is a spherical orb, metallic, in the Middle East, 2022, by an MQ-9. I will come back to the sensor question that David raised here in a moment. This is a typical example of the thing that we see most of. We see these all over the world, and we see these in, in making very interesting apparent maneuvers. This one in particular, however, I would point out, demonstrated no enigmatic technical capabilities and was no threat to airborne safety. While we are still looking at it, I don't have any more data other than that. And so being able to come to some conclusion is going to take time until we can get better resolved data on similar objects that we can then do a, a larger analysis on. Next slide, please. I'm gonna let this play through. This is a newly released uh, video. You'll notice there are two dots moving back and forth. There is a plane at the bottom that's moving across the screen, and now there are three dots moving back and forth. The moving back and forth is from the sensor and the platform that's collecting it. This is a, a P3 on a training mission in the Western United States. They picked these up and they tried to intercept and was unable to intercept them. Apart from that motion, and you'll see a little bit of uh, defocusing from the sensor itself, uh, there is no other oddity about this, except for the fact that they couldn't catch them. The reason they couldn't catch them is because after further analysis, it was shown that those objects were actually much farther away from the P3 than they thought. And in fact, when we went even deeper, looked at air traffic control data, we were able to match those to aircraft on a major uh, flight corridor heading into a major airport for landing. This is the kind of thing that can um, spoof and or provide misperception of both very highly trained pilots as well as sensors, right? And this was reported as an odd grouping of three UAP. All right. That is not to say that the pilots didn't know what they were looking at or they, they knew what they were looking at, but they weren't really sure. But it also is meant to say that when they're not sure, they're reporting it now. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. And then we have to go look at it. Next slide, please. That brings us to really what is Aero doing in the science and technical realm. So this is one of those areas that um, I'm going to expound a little bit more on than we did in the last uh, hearings. Uh, Aero has a robust scientific plan that we are required to then provide to Congress here pretty soon. Um, one of the first things that we're doing is looking across all the existing sensor data against that typical UAP target that I gave you up at the very first slide. Mm -hmm. That goes beyond DOD and IC sensors. That's commercial, that's civil, that's n and with partnership with NASA, with NASA sensors and NOAA sensors. Understanding if any of these earth sensing satellites, any of these airborne platforms, any of these ground radars, whether it's FAA or other, can actually see these things given what we've got so far, is going to be an important first step to understanding which sensors are going to be relevant. From there, we, will, we are augmenting with dedicated sensors that we've purpose-built designed to detect, track, and characterize those particular objects. We will be then putting those out in very select areas for uh, surveillance purposes. Partnerships with academia, exploring the signatures to match to our data. So understanding if a thing is moving and if it is doing certain uh, anomalous activities, what are the signatures we would expect to see? How do we pull on that? 
And then from there, how do I tune my collection architecture to go after it? Statistical analytic techniques. We're working with a couple of universities on how do I do broader-based statistical analysis on unclassified and classified data so that I can apply those analytics to our holdings. And then AI and ML analytic techniques for searching out through the data what are the, what are the objects, what are the t targets that we're going after. We have partnerships with both DOD and DOE labs to explore our current state-of-the-art fundamental physics of UAP observations, both current and historical. In other words, if I have objects, those few that are doing some things that are anomalous, what is our current understanding of maneuverability, speed, uh, signature management, uh, propulsion, what are those underlying signatures that we would expect to see and how do I then pull on that? Our interagency and allied partnerships for calibration of our capabilities. This is exactly what David was pointing at. A vast majority of what we have reported to us are DOD sensors. DOD sensors are not scientific sensors. They are not intelligence community sensors. Believe it or not, intelligence community sensors are very close to scientific sensors. They are calibrated, they are high precision, they are everything you'd ever want to know about a thing. DOD sensors have one purpose. They are to identify an object that is known and put a weapon on it. That is what they're for, right, predominantly. So understanding how do you calibrate those against these known objects? How do I fly an F-35 against a weather balloon at different speeds and different altitudes and different sun conditions and different lighting conditions and, and heating conditions? Those are all important measurements that need to be done and we are on the, uh, in process of doing that right now. That table on the right is a very simplified version of our entire test matrix, which you would not be able to fit on three of these slides against all of our sensors across all of those phenomenologies. That will be useful in order to then train our operators, pilots, and sensors against the known objects. And then finally, our pattern of life analysis. This is essentially baselining what is normal. I have all these hotspot areas, but we only have hotspot areas because that's when the reports come in from the operators that are operating at that time. They don't operate all the time. So to have a 24-7 collection monitoring campaign in some of these areas for three months at a time is going to be necessary in order to measure out what is normal. Then I'll know what is not normal. Right, when we have additional things that come through those spaces. And that includes space and maritime. Next slide, please. Which brings me to some of my recommendations for the panel and their consideration and deliberation. Um, of some of these we're going to be exploring with our, our new NASA embed, whom I'm happy to be welcoming on pretty, pretty soon, who's going to help us in our scientific plan. Uh, Crowdsourcing, unclassified open source data. This is where you know, some of the public can be helpful. You no, know, imagery from an iPhone is generally not helpful unless you are right up on whatever it is you're looking at. However, some of the ancillary data that your iPhone provides from location to speed to you know, other uh, phenomenologies and more than one of those can be very helpful. Right. Large-scale, ground-based scientific instrumentation. Um, evaluating how can I use some of these other instruments for detection. The FRB example was, was perfect, right? You have a bunch of large-scale uh, uh, instruments that were not designed for that, yet they picked them up because there was a microwave. Well, we have a, a surrogate target package of what we think these things are, at least from a, what we've got reported to us that was in the front slide. Understanding how can I evaluate that against all of these other instruments and do any of them have a chance of picking anything up that would be helpful in tipping and cueing us to get other sensors on target. I think leading that evaluation 
of the scientific uh, ground-based sensors would be useful. Also, the same thing for the Earth Sciences satellites, as we mentioned before. Intentional vice coincidental collection. So looking at how can I provide a tip and cue to both the ground and space-based um, scientific and academic sensor community to put additional sensors on a object when it is reported. I'm currently doing that with Aero, the joint staff, uh, the commands for when they get tip and cue, right? So a pilot says something, they see something, they report it in, and we're going to turn on a whole bunch of new collection to go after it. I should be able to hand that same tip and cue to the scientific and academic community. So looking at how that works would be helpful. Peer reviewing um, advanced capabilities, the parameterization and the publication of that that have not yet been engineered. We understand a lot of fundamental physics. It is the scientific uh, community's responsibility to explore and document those fundamentals in peer reviewed scientific journals to match to data so that we can weed out all kinds of different hypotheses. Right? That's how science works. We need to make sure that we are doing that. I think leading that conversation would be very helpful from NASA's perspective. Uh, archived scientific data. So we have a whole bunch of calibrated, large scale um, scientific data from all these different instrumentations around the world. Um, taking a look at how can you apply some maybe some AI ML uh, tools to search through that data for anomalous signatures that may correlate to things that we've got reporting on. That would be an interesting study. Uh, distributions of sightings. I think this is a low-hanging fruit one, right? So if we take a look at all of the distributions of sightings that are outside of my national security areas that I've got classified reporting for, and they generate the similar distribution map as we've got, and we put those two pieces together, now I have a holistic picture. And then, of course, our foreign partnerships building a robust scientific community of interest, review data, capabilities, conduct analysis, expanding upon you know, our military and intelligence co collaborations across the world into the scientific and academic world. And with that, um, those were my thoughts. Uh, we've talked about some of these in the past. It would be uh, interesting to, to hear if there's any uh, further questions or deliberations on any of those points, and I'm happy to take any questions that you all have. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirkpatrick. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank you and the ARO for your openness uh, in providing this committee with insight and information about what you've learned so far, how we could work together. I think this is very much an area where it's going to be essential that NASA be a partner, be a good partner for AARO. And I think you uh, really want to thank you for your role with this committee in helping to start to build that partnership. It's been my uh, pleasure. And let's, uh, Reggie. Yeah. Thanks, for the, thanks for the briefing. Um, question, uh, we talked a lot about data already. Let's talk about sensors for a second. So you mentioned that you work with labs, academia. Do you see a need to go beyond what you mentioned earlier? That is the type of sensors that we have right now, which are based on national security threats and certain phenomenologies and frequency range of these kinds of things. Do you see a reason of going beyond that? Yep, and absolutely. So what, what are some of the challenges you see there, materials or what have you? So can we go back to the front slide, just the first slide where the target um, characterization is. Uh, so we've, we've purpose built a couple of, of sensors to do search across that, nope, down one, there you go, that's great. Um, to go down some of those characteristics to see if we can find them correlated to uh, pilot reporting. Right. Uh, some of those are, um, initially this is gonna be, I'm gonna say this is a bootstrap method. Right. We're doing a broad spectrum search across very few indicators that we can point to that will allow, enable us to get a little bit more data, refine that, narrow those um, sensors, and, and, and go from there. So we aren't just relying on the DOD and IC sensors that exist today because, frankly, they don't point to where we want them to point. 
right? I mean, I'll be frank with, with everyone. We, we can point the largest collection apparatus in the entire globe at any point we want. You just have to tell me where I want to point it. Second piece of that is a lot of what we have is, is around the continental United States. Most people, including uh, the government, don't like it when I point our entire collection apparatus to your backyard, right? It's, it's not allowed. We have some laws about that, and we've got to figure out how to do this only in the areas that, that I can get high confidence there's going to be something there, and high confidence I'm not going to break any laws doing it. Right? So there's a, there's a trade there. So some of these ground-based point detectors are going to be necessary for that to point up, to point out, to search. Coupled with, we're evaluating a number of sensor opportunities across uh, different organizations, academia, uh, industry, whatnot, that, that already exist or are being built for similar purposes or maybe other purposes that I might be able to recalibrate for this and see if those will have a chance of, of seeing that target, right? So that's where the modeling and SIM comes in. Can I, can I take that target, put it into your sensor, and have a chance of seeing it? If I can, then I might want to use that. Oh, wait. Who's hey, next? Are you? Are you? Nadia. Nadia. Oh, go. Um, thanks, Sean. I have the questions you probably don't want, which are about numbers, um, unless I missed them during your presentation. Uh, you had said that only a very small percentage of your cases display signatures that could be anomalous, and then followed that up with the few objects that do demonstrate potentially anomalous characteristics. What numbers are we talking about? How big that's, is that's, your database? How many years topic. was it collected over? Yeah. And uh, were those observations made? And then by few, what do you mean? Right. No, that's a great question. Um, so this chart, as I mentioned, we've updated with our current uh, data holdings. At the time of my open hearing, we were at 650 cases-ish. We are now over 800. Um, we are putting together our uh, annual report, which will be due August 1 uh, to the Hill, and in it, and there will be an unclassified version as there always has been, uh, we will have those updated numbers at that time. We roughly get, I mean, you can do the math, you know, it depends anywhere from, from 50 to 100-ish new reports a month. Now, the reason we had such a big jump recently is because I got FAA's data integrated in finally, and so we ended up with like 100 and some odd new cases. Um, so there's, there's reason why it's going to fluctuate. The numbers that I would say, so um, we're going we're gonna to try to do a little more uh, uh, fidelity on some of the analytics when we report out. But the numbers I would say that we see are possibly really anomalous are less than single digit percentages of those, that total database. So maybe two to five ish percent. Who's next? Who's next? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. All right. I'll stand up because I'm, I'm on the other you. end of the room. Um, thanks, Sean, for your presentation and for the some of the video footage that we saw. Um, while we're all good scientists on this panel, I think that I look at it with an untrained eye of looking at that video. And so I see three spots moving, and everything else in the background looks like it's stable. Can you talk a little bit more about either the sensor platform or what we're seeing that's stable in the background? Because they've been identified as airplanes, um, and there's clear description of, of from other data sources that came in to help clarify that. Um, but when I look at this, what are all of the white spots in the background that we're seeing that are stable? So those are these. That's a star background. Pretty sure that's a star background. Now, so you're looking at those planes were roughly mm, 
30 to 40-ish miles away, if I remember correctly. And when you see that smaller plane that comes in at the bottom, uh, that one was much, much closer. It was like maybe six to 10 miles away, right? And so the jitter in the sensor is, is what you're looking at. Right, okay, so the three spots, because they look like they're moving at about the same. Right, they are. Right, and, and if they were flying together, but they're not, is what I'm hearing. This they're is in the a, sensor they're in, a, they're in a flight line. Right. So they're equally spaced in a flight line, and the sensor is jittering. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Yes. He, I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. he's been, Walter's been yeah, waiting. Patiently waiting. Okay, if you go to your first slide, if you don't mind. Not the title slide, but the, the, the one trends that had the, slide, the trends, please. yeah. Um, it's the previous slide. There, there you, go. you go. Thank you. So I want to make sure I understand the slide. It says typically reported characteristics. And there are a bunch of things here, like, for example, size, altitude, speed. If it's being observed from a single sensor, use the example of like the airplanes that were coming in. And if you don't know how far away they are, how do you assess the size? Correct. How do you assess the speed? Um, this is what people would report, but it isn't necessarily, what for is example, real. the size of the object or the speed or any of the rest of it. Do I understand that correctly? Partially. Okay. So you, this, this is not all single sensor observations. Some of these are very much multi-sensor observations. Okay. And this is parameterized to cover the range of things for any given parameter, the range of, of what's possible and what is been observed. Okay, and then on the next slide, the one where you've got the, or it is, the meatball moving across the, the screen. Right, that one. Um, so was there any look at <clears throat> sensor artifact, data processing artifact, um, I mean, the first thing that, whenever I say anything that's anomalous, I look at how is the data collected. Yeah. So yes, these are these are. Um, so this is an EO sensor on an MQ9, and we understand that very very well. So that is that is a real object. Absolutely. Okay. Anna, Anna Marie. You mentioned that in uh, partnership with academia, you also use AI ML techniques for existing data sets, uh, possibly some of them uh, open source. Can you explain a little bit more what kind of AI ML techniques you are using? Um, are these about anomaly detection? Uh, are you using anything related to natural language processing? Are you using anything related to yep. computer vision? Right. Um, so we're looking at uh, a number of different capabilities that span, I think, a lot of what you've just said. So we've got, uh, we haven't applied it yet. We are researching how we're going to apply it. So natural language processing for the reports from pilots. Absolutely. All right. Uh, target recognition. So I can train a model to look for that thing and go back through all of our holdings and go, how, give me how many of these you have, right? Um, and then try to figure out what those are. Um, so I have not put anything out there yet or have not looked at anything yet for um, active targeting in real time because I don't know exactly what I would train it to go look for. I just know what we have. So I want to get more confidence on what we have before I go and do that, except for balloons. Right? <coughs> we, we're, we're trying to get rid of balloons as quickly as possible. So, Sean, I just wanted to begin by thanking you for your service to this nation, this committee. You don't exactly have the easiest job in Washington. So no, I do not. Appreciate it. I'm glad I you also, recognize that. Yes, <laughs> we certainly do. I also want to commend uh, you noting the international partnerships. Uh, Spain just signed the Artemis Accords yesterday, increasing the membership to 25. I think that's a global partnership that you could leverage. Only 170 more countries to go, NASA, before we have everyone signed up. I, I just have two questions. One, relative to what Nadia was asking you about, the number of anomalous phenomena. 
What makes it anomalous in your view? What is the phenomenology where you're pulling those cases out and saying this is truly unexplained? And then my second question would be relative to the stigma. How damaging is that in your view? And what in particular do you think NASA can do to help remedy the situation? Those are great questions. I'm going to take the second one first because I know we're getting short on time. Um, the, the stigma has improved significantly over the years since the Navy first took this on um, some years ago. It is not gone, and in fact, I would argue the stigma exists inside um, the leadership of all of our, our buildings, right, wherever that is. Um, uh, my team and I have also been subject to lots of harassment, uh, especially coming out of my last hearing, uh, because people don't understand the scientific method and why, it do why we have to do the things we have to do, right? And because we can't just come out and say, you know, the greatest, the greatest thing that could happen to me is I could come out and say, hey, I know where all these things are. Here you go, all right? But I don't, right? And it's going to take us time to research all that. Um, people want answers now, and so they are, they're actually feeding the stigma by, by exhibiting that kind of behavior to all of us, right? That is, that is a bad thing. Where can NASA help? I made that recommendation on NASA should lead the scientific discourse. We need to elevate this conversation. We need to have this conversation in an, in an open environment like this where we aren't going to get harassed because this is a hard problem. It is a hard target problem. We need to understand what is the things that are in all of our domains, space or air or undersea, and how do we make sense of that? Um, your first question on what makes it anomalous to me uh, we actually developed some definitions on all of these things. We gave it both to the White House and to Congress. I think we've got some of that into law now. But essentially, anomalous is anything that is not readily understandable by the operator or the sensor. Right? So it is doing something weird, whether that's maneuvering against the wind at Mach 2 with no apparent propulsion or it's um, going into the water, which we have, we have shown is not the case. That is actually a sensor anomaly uh, that we've now figured out, and we're going to be publishing all of that. Um, you know, those kinds of things make anomalous signature, uh, we'll call it signature ma management, but it's things that are um, not readily understandable in the context of, hey, I've got a thing that's out in the light. It should reflect a certain amount of light. If it doesn't reflect that amount of light, something weird. I think we have time for one last question. Um, Sean, you recommended a foreign partnership with NASA. I'm curious, especially given your map, uh, have you, as ARA, partnered with international agencies and is there ways for reporting to your mm -hmm. so that's that's a great question i want to expound on that just a little bit um, so i have just held uh, our first five eyes forum on this subject um, last week i think it was or earlier this week i don't know dan was there uh, and we have ex you know we've we've entered into discussions with our partners on data sharing, how do they do reporting, what kind of analysis can they help us with, what kind of calibration can they help us with, what can we help them with, and we're establishing all of that right now. Um, and they're going to end up, you know, sending their information and data to us uh, to feed into the process that we've laid out for how we're going to, to do all of this. Um, beyond that, I have not had either the time or the bandwidth to do, and that's why I would look to NASA to expand the scientific and, and uh, academic relationships that they have across all of our allies and partners on how can we bring them into the fold. That, that's where I think there's a, a lot of benefit to NASA taking lead on that. Great. Uh, thank you. But, um, one just 
clarifications for people who don't know, what are the five eyes? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the five eyes, those are uh, that's the UK, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. So those are the five partners. Terrific. So uh, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Would like to thank the panel for the opportunity to, to come and give an overview of the FAA and, and uh, some data points around the FAA's mission, uh, the data the FAA provides to provide the framing of what are the surveillance systems that, that we can bring to bear or, or there, there's data around those sensors, as well as to frame the limitations of those. I know Sean talked about some of the data points that, uh, that, are, that are used and being integrated. So hopefully this will give you an overview of the FAA's mission as well as, as, well as those data points. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the FAA's mission is, is quite large and complex. Uh, by, by a factor of two, we operate uh, more commercial aircraft than any other country. I think we're second only to Australia in total airspace, but largely because Australia has a very large oceanic volume that they're responsible for, for managing. So it is a very complex, very large uh, national airspace system. Uh, we have four, over 14,000 controllers, uh, 520 air traffic control towers, which are located at the, the, the highest density of, of airports. And I'll refer to those as towers in, in, in subsequent slides. We have 147 what we call terminal radar approach controls or TRACONs, and those are manned um, uh, control facilities at the, the high and medium density airports around the nation as well as 21 air route traffic uh, control centers, which, are, which manage the control of, of air traffic in the in route environment. Uh, there's 19,000, over 19,000 airports, 5,000, over 5,000 of those are associated uh, public airports uh, with the remaining 14,000 plus uh, private airports. The next slide, please. So the FAA's mission is primarily around safe and efficient control of manned aircraft. That has been our, our historical mission and, and it remains our primary mission, uh, certainly as we talk about uh, new entrants with UASs and advanced air mobility and some of those things, there will be an evolution of the FAA's mission to include safe operation of the NAS with those, those new entrants. But uh, the, the architecture and design of the NAS is, is geared around safe and efficient control of aircraft and manned aircraft. Uh, the, certainly the, the commercial aspect, the commercial flights are a primary focus of the agency. We certainly support uh, general aviation and uh, flights as well. Um, but again, our mission is around manned aircraft and safe and, and efficient operation of those. Um, the, uh, by the numbers, uh, over 16 million flights yearly uh, 5,400 flights uh, at peak any given uh, at the peak time of any given day. Uh, 45,000 daily flights, um, 25 million GA flight hours per year. A uh, very large, very complex uh, operation that uh, that we're responsible for managing. Uh, we certainly provide a, a significant contribution to to that for that service to to the nation in the form of a uh, you know, product uh, toward a GDP. Next slide. So as, as we get into the discussion of surveillance services, I want to provide a little bit of framework around uh, the categorization of our surveillance services. And we primarily b break those into two, two bodies. The cooperative surveillance, which, which is defined by an, a sensor that's avionics or equipment on board the aircraft that works in conjunction with ground-based sensors. The non-cooperative surveillance is independent. This is basically uh, the classic radar. RF energy is transmitted out, reflects off the target, and we receive that signal. And from that return, we can determine where that, 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 that aircraft is. Typically, these cooperative and non-cooperative sensors are co-located together. Uh, one, the cooperative mounted on top of the non-cooperative radar. So from the purpose, from a data perspective, I think in, in this, this panel, in the study, I, pr I think that the cooperative sensors, those are neither unknown <laughs> or anomalous. So for the purposes of this, uh, this briefing or the rest of this briefing, I'm going to focus on the, the non-cooperative aspect. Next slide, please. So 
the again from the standpoint of the mission of the FAA around it again is is primarily around manned aircraft and I think that ser serves as an important framework for the data points and the type of data that we can bring to bear you know, for this panel so we break our our systems and the design of the systems into different uh, types of systems so we have short range radars which are typically located at uh, the high and medium density airports and those operate from a, a range, they have a detection range of between 40 and 60 miles and an altitude detection capability of about 24,000 feet. The long range radar systems have a detection range of two to 250 nautical miles with uh, altitude detection up to 100,000 feet. So that provides the basic uh, the framework for, for those. I will mention uh, the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast or ADSB. Uh, only from a context that that does serve as a primary data source and a preferred data source for the management of the airspace system, but it is a cooperative system and for the purposes of the next slides as I get into the discussion of the coverage and the type of detection uh, for those non-cooperative targets, uh, it is not considered as part of those. And also surface surveillance uh, is also something that we provide, but again for the purpose of the study, I only include those for just a completeness perspective. The uh, one final point, when I talk about manned uh, aircraft and primary mission for the drones and balloons and things of that nature, their basic premise is to operate in a not to interfere basis, that they are not to interfere with manned operations and that's, that's a, a fundamental aspect as we talk to the data and what we can and can detect with respect to those non-manned non -manned systems. Next slide, please. Realizing this is an eye chart, this, I would wanted to provide just a, a, a graphical or pictorial depiction of where our sensors are located. Uh, the green, blue, and pink balloons, if you will, uh, represent our short range radars. Those are, are located at, at, uh, at airports. Those are where those are, are, are sighted. The, uh, the two reddish uh, balloons, they have letters in them, a four and a C. Those represent our long range radars, the Arcer fours and Carcer systems that are used in, in the context of both from an air traffic control perspective as well as for a national defense and homeland security mission. And the, the, um, the perimeter, the uh, Arcer fours are located around the perimeter of the country equally spaced and the Carcer systems are located on the interior of, of the U.S. I will point out that this only depicts the CONUS. There are systems, uh, AT ATC, both short range and long range systems, Hawaii, Alaska, and uh, Caribbean. Uh, those are not depicted here. Um, I didn't think they were necessary for the, uh, the, the purpose of understanding the surveillance. Um, and I will also point out that both for this slide and the subsequent coverage slide, we, I do not talk to any classified DOD or DJ systems that are in an operation. Okay. Next slide, please. So what it is, what can the FAA detect and, and surveil, what can, can we not? Uh, this slide gives you uh, a by altitude slice of what it is that we can detect. So if you look at the, the, the square that's labeled a thousand foot AGL that depicts by sensor for an aircraft that is a thousand feet in altitude what is the range at which we can detect that aircraft and so on as you, if you, you get higher in altitude uh, or further higher in altitude you can detect it at further range and that's basically a phenomenon of the curvature of the earth and the line of sight aspect of these these radar systems so pretty good coverage across the the US at 10,000 feet and above. Uh, this is a mathematical model based of a pure line of sight uh, as well as some geographical screening. As you can see in the western part of the US, there, are, there is screening in, in due to the mountains and those sensors. I need to take a little bit of time and talk about the, the nature of the targets. These line of sight models, uh, represent uh, the, uh, an input of a target that is one square meter. So think of a, a sphere of one meter in diameter. That's the assumption that goes into these models. So if you think about that in the context of other forms of, of aircraft, 
a fourth generation F-15 or F-18 is in the pro proximity of about one square meter, perhaps a little bit larger. A large airliner is perhaps 100 square meters. A small UAS is perhaps uh, a, a one or a 0 0.01 square meter. So the range of these detections or the, or the size and the ability to detect these targets from a F, an F-15 large airliner 100 times larger in size, a drone 100 times smaller in size. So the detection uh, of and a surveillance capability really largely depends in part to the, the target that we're talking about and, and the ability to surveil that target. All right, next slide. So I do include this ADB, ADSB coverage slide just to give a context of, from a cooperative perspective, uh, there is very good coverage uh, across the U.S. to 1,500 feet above ground level. So this provide a context of what, when we look at the data and start getting a discussion of what it is we can detect, this will certainly be, uh, for those cooperative uh, aircraft that have ADSB, we could certainly uh, detect those to a pretty, a pretty low altitude across, across the U.S. All right, a couple of data points, I think, um, I know Sean certainly talked about some of the data points, and I can provide a little bit of insight uh, from an FAA perspective. Uh, drones, drones are, are a pretty significant challenge. There's 880,000 uh, registered drones in the U.S., um, uh, small drones, I should say, uh, part one, uh, 107 drones. Um, many tens of thousands of those are operate, operated on a daily basis uh, for, by commercial operators. It's not clear how many private drone operators are taking their, their drone up for a, a quick flight. Um, but as I said earlier, those are regulated by, uh, they're, they're regulated to operate below 400 feet in altitude. So again, it's the drone aspect is for those small drones in particular, as, and as well as all, of, all classes of drones, there are regulatory restrictions to where they can and cannot fly, basically avoiding and not interfering with manned aircraft operations. Second data point, we talked about balloons, uh, the weather service. We know on 190, or 92 weather stations that release balloons twice a day uh, at uh, 6 a.m. and, and uh, uh, 0, 0, 100 Zulu and, and 1200 Zulu. Um, typically two hour duration, they fly up to 100,000 feet where the, the envelope bursts and, and then the, the payload uh, descends back, back to earth. So certainly, um, you know, at least 184 balloon flights daily uh, in the NAS. You know, not to consider universities and hobbyist balloons that, that, that may be launched, but those are typically small, uh, small in size. And finally, uh, Sean did talk about UAPs and, and FAA data, uh, a couple of data points that we do report. There is a process by which air traffic controllers can report uh, UAP uh, sightings or, 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 or events. Uh, historically, those have been in the range of about three to five reports per month that have been reported. Uh, we did see an uptick of, of reports in August of 22 uh, that, that went up to about 8 to 10, perhaps due to Starlink, Starlink launches. Uh, um, and finally, the, uh, with the, the Chinese weather uh, or the Chinese balloon incident in February, we did see a significant uptick, an uptick and there's like 68 uh, UAP uh, reports um, that, that's, that started in February, and we've seen a large number you know, subsequent to, then, to that. Uh, I think that's all I had. Um, any questions? Anybody's Do you want to take the question? It's easy. Actually, you can call, choose the questioners. It's easier for your angle than for me. All right, Walter. Yeah, so two questions. Two questions about the, uh, the, the radar data coverage. First one is, uh, do you retain any of the data, or is it um, – just cycled over as there is a retention and long-term retention of data uh, I, I can't recall exactly how long we retain that there's certainly a, a requirement from a uh, retention from a um, legal perspective yeah, exa exactly um, but I do know there is some periodicities in a measured in a term is, of months is it retained in terms of like the raw 
radar or is some processed form of data that's retained? I believe it's a processed form of data that is what was displayed on the, uh, whether it's an, the, an Indian root ERAM system yeah. or the, the STAR system. And then the other question is for the radars, um, are they operated in any sort of a tasked mode or are they constant search mode? The current systems in our inventory just they're, they're fixed face and they just rotate at either okay. 12 RPM or 5 RPM, depending okay. on whether it's an in route or a terminal uh, surveillance okay. Thanks. requirement. All right, next question. Yes. Mike, forgive me if, uh, if you mentioned this earlier. You said, like, I think you said three to five reports per month. Per month. Out of how many? That is three to five reports per month for all of the controllers and all of the U.S. So there's a, a process by which if they see something and they want to report that, they can go to report that to the, uh, the, the den, we call it, but uh, report, hey, I saw something, I don't know what it was. So that's three to five per month across the entire, you know, 14,000 controllers yeah. per month. So, you know, 45,000 operations any given day, 30 months, 30 days, however many days in a month, you know, it's a very small percentage. Yeah. Uh, can you describe actually about this? How do you do you encourage uh, to report? Do you feel like the stigma on UAPs is impairing the reporting? Do you yeah, think the I, reporting I, is biased? I'm not aware of. Uh, of uh, well, I'll answer it this way: um, the 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 process by which uh, UAP is reported is part of the air traffic controller order. So basically the air traffic controllers are allowed, it says, you know, if you see something, here's a process by which, you, the procedure by which you would report it. Other than that, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any specific stigma or, or limitations, and I'd really, probably not in a good position to, you know, to speak to that other than there is that process, and that is the process that we use to, and, the, and is what represents those numbers I talked to. And if I may have, I had a question prior to this one. How do you uh, decide the sites where you deploy? You saw, we saw the map, and it has some very good coverage on the coastal areas. There were some areas of lack of coverage. Yeah. So if we went, if you go back, go back one slide from what's presented here. Um, the what you'll see is in the eastern half of the U.S. There's a lot better coverage, but that's because there's a lot more population in the east and therefore a lot more airports. And these systems are historically sited at the airports in support of those, those airport operations. To the west, obviously, oops, to less, less dense and uh, fewer systems. Now, the, that's from um, an ASR, the short range radar perspective. The long range radars are pretty much equally spaced to provide, the, in order to provide the maximum coverage from a homeland defense and security perspective, as well as with the higher altitude flights, the in route uh, cruise phase of air traffic control. Warren. Uh, Mike, first, thank you and the FAA for coming to, to share this information with us. Second, uh, can you speak to a little bit uh, of the filtering techniques that we use? So with respect to, I, I know Walter had a question about the raw data and process, but can you just talk a little bit about we actually aren't trying to detect everything. <laughs> you know, that's actually a very good question and a very good point with respect to what we can and cannot see. So um, there are, you know, the closer to the ground you point a, a radar, uh, certainly you can get lower elevations, but you also start to see the effects of trees and other ground-based clutter, as we call it, that starts to interfere. So we, we have great ability to detect a lot of things, but, but from an FAA mission perspective, our desire is to find that sweet spot of seeing everything to as low an altitude as we can um, to maximize our mission around safe operations of manned aircraft. Now to pull that thread just a little bit further, you know, there's also limitations with respect to biologicals or, or insects and dust and things of this, this flavor that uh, most aircraft fly above a certain speed. So we typically will have uh, filtering settings on our systems to get rid of the stuff that really is leaves or insects or things of that nature so that we provide as clean a, a, a dis display for the controllers. So there are specific settings that we, we can can adjust, and it's been learned over many years to perfect those, what we call optimization, of those kinds of filters to get rid of what is not a manned aircraft, not an aircraft, and, and provide as clean a display for the controllers as we can. Yes? Yeah. 
please. Oh, um, thank you. Thanks for the pr presentation. Um, would it be kind of following up what you said, Warren? Um, would it be possible to um, to collect the raw data and to save that? Because if if it would be possible to do some calibration after the fact that Sean was mentioning, for example, you might be to capture other phenomenology. Is that possible? Well, when you say raw data, I think you'd ha we'd have to talk a little bit about what is meant. Um, so, you know, what from a, a, a technical perspective, pure what we would call I and Q data yeah. is huge, huge, you know, gigabyte, very, very, very large um, volumes of data. Uh, that would probably be uh, cost prohibitive, and we certainly don't do that today. Um, the, the there are again we do record data but it is effectively the data that is has been through some form of these processings and these filterings we do that uh, today um, but it, it it certainly with enough time and money we could certainly collect that data and I think it but it would be a uh, we'd have to look at the challenge of of, in, of how we would go about modifying the systems or, or introducing new ways to collect that that raw data as you as you described certainly it's feasible it's possible but it's not without technical challenge. Well, the question on the yes. 100, 184 balloon flights daily, are those characterized or they just you just know they do that and then you, they just end up where they are? So under the balloon, I'll call it part 101, the regulations for balloons, there's very specific requirements. So for National Weather Service, before they release those, they'll contact the local air traffic facility. They're going to say, here's what time I'm going to release it. And when they release it, they have tracking and they provide that tracking uh, to uh, the air traffic control facility throughout the flight of, of, of you know, that particular balloon. There are commercial balloons that are also launched, but those most, for the most part, as I understand it, have, um, they actually transmit their GPS position in support of where they're flying so as to ensure they're not interfering with, with air traffic and to ensure the air traffic controllers are aware of where those, those balloons are operating. Yes, ma'am. We've talked about reporting the three to five per month um, from air traffic control, but what about from the non-cooperative surveillance? Has there been anomalies from the sensors themselves? And if so, what is the process for that? I would say the FAA mission is not around anomalies with the, the non-cooperative sensors themselves. So as we build an air traffic control picture, we, we have both the non-cooperative systems, which detects the target. We have a cooperative system that also detects a target and we will tend to merge those those uh, targets together and so, and so on a controller's display they'll know is this a, a non-cooperative only or a merged or combined target so that they know you know basically an increased level of confidence that on what it is they're seeing is in fact a real aircraft so we don't dis make any real distinction uh, between a non-cooperative and a cooperative other than how they get combined and put on a controller's display. So I don't know if that answered your... Unregistered flight? Uh, so, so like a GA flight that does not, it's flying visual flight rules, uh, those will just be picked up by the, if they're, even if they don't, if they're not equipped with a, with a, co with a cooperative uh, avionics, those would just be picked up by the non-cooperative system that ha if they happen to surveil where that aircraft is, is flying. And so that certainly will be put on the controller's display and they will be able to provide um, awareness. In fact, there's a, a flight following uh, procedure by which GA pilots can ask for, hey, I'm not, I'm not squawking, I don't have a, co a cooperative system, but please help me and just uh, through, via the radio, I'm gonna go on from here to here and, and providing awareness, uh, situational awareness, if the controller has the bandwidth to, to provide that data. One last question from mine. Yes. So I'm a, not a scientist, I'm a recovering attorney, and I love process. And a few questions there. If I'm a pilot, where do I find that process for reporting UAPs? Where is that articulated or captured? Second, when you mentioned that you're reporting these incidents, who are you reporting it to? And are those incidents pulling on the thread that Reggie started, are they being archived anywhere? Uh, I believe they are archived. Uh, they're reported to uh, the domestic network uh, event network. It's an NFA organization or, or function. Um, I don't. I, I can't speak to whether for whether they would be say part of what uh, Sean would would include as part of his database. I presume so. Um, 
So I think that was the answer to the second question. Uh, what was the first question again? I'm sorry. Uh, where does the reporting process live? If I'm a pilot, I see a UAP, where do I go to find uh, out? That, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I said I'm familiar with the reporting process from a controller perspective and the order that's, that's used to define how controllers do their job. I am not, I, I don't know the answer to the question from a pilot perspective. Gotcha. Great. So, uh, Thank you, Mike, for your presentation right. and uh, for the, all the help the FAA has given us as we've been learning more about the very impressive system that all the right. FAA maintains. Uh, thank you. I know thank you for what, having me. You know, for me, one of the many takeaways from this is uh, feeling you know, uh, just a little bit safer every time I fly and thankful for you and your colleagues for what they do to make that possible. Uh, so the first speaker will be Dr. Nadia Drake talking about framing the issue of UAP. Hello, and welcome back from lunch, everybody, and a welcome to those of you watching us virtually. Um, I'm Nadia. I am a scientist by training. I'm also a science journalist now, and my job is to try and synthesize the information that we've learned so far and summarize the situation. So if you will, um, put together a framework for thinking about UAP. Now I'm gonna try and do this in a way that reflects the thoughts of the entire panel, although obviously we have a variety of opinions and ideas among us. Um, so I'd like to leave some time at the end for you to weigh in with disagreements or concurrences as needed. So first, a housekeeping matter. The definition of UAP changed during the seven months of our fact-finding process. UAP initially stood for unidentified aerial phenomena with aerial referring to events occurring in Earth's atmosphere. That A is now defined as anomalous, which includes the space, air, and undersea domains. As a panel, I think we have decided to continue focusing our recommendations on the aerial domain, because that is where the majority of sightings and events have occurred, and also because we couldn't fully pivot to address the expanded scope of the new acronym. Beyond that, there are three points I wanna make. The first is that for a number of reasons, UAP are obviously quite interesting. Right, that is why we are here. Recently, many credible witnesses have reported seeing unidentified objects in the sky, some of which are behaving rather peculiarly. peculiarly. In some instances, these reports include corroborating data from various instruments, various sensors. The challenge that we have is that the data needed to explain these anomalous sightings often do not exist or are incomplete for generating a conclusive analysis. This includes eyewitness reports, which on their own can be interesting and compelling, but often lack the information needed to make definitive conclusions about an object's provenance. We as a panel are thinking about the types of data that might add value to those reports and which could be useful on their own. As a corollary to date, in the refereed scientific literature, there is no conclusive evidence suggesting an extraterrestrial origin for UAP. Collecting more good data for the scientific community to review in a peer-reviewed context will be important for progress to, me, to be made here. The second point, UAP offer an excellent opportunity to demonstrate the power of the scientific method and of empirically addressing a question using a multidisciplinary approach. It is our job as a panel to make some recommendations about how NASA might go about tackling this topic scientifically, taking advantage of the agency's resources, global outreach, and reputation. Key points to keep in mind here are that science is, hypoth science is hypothesis driven. Scientists build confidence in their theories by relying on well calibrated, well collected data, using well established methods with rigorous evaluation and independent corroboration. In science, skepticism is not a bias, nor is it a bad word. It is not our job to define nature, but to study it in ways that let nature reveal itself to us, regardless of how exciting or disappointing that reality might be. And to that end, when we're thinking about making recommendations about how NASA can tackle this topic scientifically, I think it's important to remember that it's not NASA's job to replicate the efforts of the Department of Defense, but rather to consider approaches that are complementary to what the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office is doing. 
And so one of the questions that we as a panel, I think, need to center is, what can we recommend that NASA can do that the DOD cannot? Third point, to that end, what are we even looking for? How are we defining this problem? And how do the available data define what seems to be, to borrow a cliche, a very slender needle in a very big haystack? We heard a little bit about that today from Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, who reported that there have been 800 events um, collected over about 27 years. And between two and 5% of those events display signatures that could be anomalous defined as anything that is not readily understandable by the operator or the sensor, something that is doing something weird. Mr. Free and some of the experts on our panel have defined the background on which those events exist, the amount of stuff in the sky at any given time, like so. On average, FAA air traffic control handles 45,000 flights per day in US airspace, with 5,400 aircraft in the sky at peak time. Worldwide, on average, there are about 1,600 weather balloon launches per day. In the US, there are at least 184 of those balloons launched, and that doesn't include private companies or research flights. There are about 1.69 million recreational or model small uncrewed aircraft systems, and an additional 880,000 drones are registered for commercial use. And these are not controlled by air traffic control, and they're not scheduled flights. So that's our challenge. So in making recommendations as a panel, I think we need to look at what kind of imprint we want to leave. What does the situation look like five years from now? What does it look like 10 years from now? Why are we making these recommendations? We heard a little bit about this this morning uh, from both Mike and David, who noted that many discoveries in science are rooted in initially unexplained and bizarre phenomena. So by carefully scrutinizing the sky, or however we end up defining our search space, and by collaborating across disciplines, we are likely to learn new things about our planet. That's a fact. And that's the commensal science case we might want to consider when making recommendations here. All right. Does anyone have, have thoughts? Questions, thoughts, comments? Colin. Carlin. I agree with you, and I think that is a parameter that we need to define as a panel. Yeah, I'll just uh, quickly jump in and, and echo some remarks I made this morning that, yes, the A changed from aerial to anomalous, but it's also accurate to say that the preponderance of events are in the aerial domain. That being said, your panel scope has expanded outwards, and I think we'll hear a little bit um, from David later on that very subject. I mean, I think anomalous, people often think about it as going down, and including ocean, but I think what's very relevant for NASA is going out, mm -hmm. right? And you know, looking at things in our solar system. And I think in some sense, um, I think oh, there's certain responsibilities in, you know, when we look at airspace, there's FAA responsibilities, there's DOD responsibilities. As you get further and further away from the Earth, eventually it's all NASA. <laughs> Once you get out, you know, towards, the, you know, most of, certainly much of the solar system and out uh, to our galaxy, that's all NASA. And uh, uh, when we start, the, you know, thinking about things like, uh, you know, and this will be, you know, David will get to this, observations beyond the Earth's atmosphere. I think this change in language lets us also think about uh, out, you know, further out in the solar system as well. So I thought that was the perfect uh, intro and segue by Dr. Drake for addressing why NASA? Uh, what, what is or what are NASA's roles in UAP studies? So. NASA primarily is a science-driven agency. It's committed to exploring and understanding air and space. And this includes, as we were just discussing, the unknown, right? Whether that's the farthest reaches of the universe or right here on our home planet. 
In that light, NASA has over 60 years of experience measuring phenomena in air and space, in space um, and air that might be aeronautics, astronomy, as well as measuring other Earth phenomena, and this may include aquatic or atmospheric phenomena as well. And they do this using the unique vantage point of space. NASA's mission, data, and technical expertise in science and engineering may also help investigate and understand any of the reported phenomena. It makes sense to explore what new observations or measurements or studies might contribute to the understanding of reported phenomena. In that light, uh, Dr. Fox made this point this morning, there's a tremendous archive of NASA data. Uh, these are from satellites and other space-based and ground networks, as well as other assets, and these are freely and openly available to the public. NASA research, as was mentioned, also supports a wide range of methods. This includes advanced data analysis, modeling, cutting-edge computational and data visualization tools, and these are all useful for investigating unexplained observations, which may be crucial in studying these phenomena. Discoveries and results are all publicly available. And this can be something from the characterization of extraterrestrial solar planets or the hole in the ozone layer. And these are communicated publicly through many outlets through the agency. NASA also has a longstanding public trust. This is essential to communicate those findings about phenomena to the public and, as was mentioned several times, very important to destigmatize the reporting and raise awareness of cultural and social barriers to doing so. NASA has a unique strength in leveraging public and private partnerships that could result in new technologies that may be useful in observing and understanding reported phenomena. These partners could include other federal agencies. We've heard from the FAA today, as well as um, NOAA was identified. And they may collect data that could help to understand reported phenomena. In addition, NASA has a strong record of international collaboration, which could be beneficial to study any of these phenomena, as that may require global cooperation and data sharing. And then one thing that really um, strikes me is that new understanding of anomalous events really comes from when we bring communities together, interdisciplinary communities that would not necessarily collaborate. Um, and in, in my world, that might be biological and physical oceanographers, and I tell people to think a little more broadly, what if we brought together astronomers and earth scientists like we did on this panel? So um, that, those interdisciplinary research teams, as well as citizen scientists, could explore historical and current NASA and partner data for events, or more importantly, for environmental conditions around the time of reported events. And this may help in our understanding. And then finally, um, given NASA's experience with long-term missions, long-term projects, and scientific focus, the agency is really well equipped to handle the extensive and ongoing study of phenomena investigation that this likely requires. So hopefully that gave you some thoughts as to why NASA. I don't know if any of my fellow panelists agree or disagree. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> Yes, Paula, thank you. So NASA has a, a great visibility in the community and, not, and UAPs are obviously of great interest to a very diverse range of people. So can you speak <coughs> a bit about the opportunity that this provides for NASA to expand um, you know, the knowledge of the, the understanding of the scientific method? Yes, um, so it's a great question. Uh, there are multiple opportunities I think UAP present. Um, the first, as I mentioned, I think is to um, bring together interdisciplinary research teams and scientists and citizen scientists um, to really take a look at with a, an objective and perhaps unique eye um, what the NASA data archive actually means. Um, blend in the partnerships, a renewed partnership that's at the federal, the international, and the private level, right? Um, so I think there are any number of pathways that people could pursue that could be really advantageous for helping us to understand 
what's happening with any reported UAP. The questions. Uh, thank you, Paula. This is Shelley Wright. Um, actually, my question and comment actually goes to both uh, you and Nadia. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick gave us a definition of anomalous that was that it was not readily understandable to the operator or the sensor. And from the NASA's perspective, and for our panel, I think we have to consider a broader definition if we're talking about citizen science. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious of how we incorporate that, especially within the communication avenues that we were just discussing. It's a good question. Um, so, um, not all data in an archive are user friendly, right? Right out of the, the gate. But uh, I think NASA does an excellent job making things like quick look or browse products available. You can go on the NASA website. You can look at different aspects of different things that the agency has in its mission to study. And I think, um, if nothing else, uh, people have become a lot more in touch with their surroundings and their environment and the changes happening there. And so I think there's probably an opportunity uh, for people to maybe not become overnight experts in how to process satellite data and use it for basic research in a complex fashion. But there are ways to utilize those data to look at your environment if you think you've you know, seen something or you wish to report something. So communication, engagement in the public, I think is a really important part of the destigmatization, for sure. Nadia, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, I, I, was, I was struck by the phrase not readily understandable. I felt like that was actually doing a lot of work. Um, so I think for our purposes, we probably want to come up with a slightly more specific definition of what anomalous actually means. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Federica Bianco. I am an astrophysicist and a data scientist, and I bring this perspective to the panel. So for the next few minutes, I want to emphasize some of the things that my colleagues have already mentioned about the data, particularly the status of the data that exists, and what the data that we should collect um, to really understand what may be. Um, we've already heard in a few cases by a few people that NASA's role is to explore the universe through the scientific method. The application of the scientific method to discovery requires that the data meet some standards that um, allow the data-driven approach. And there are many standards that have been established in the scientific community over the years. I can mention one, for example, it's called the FAIR standard, where FAIR stands for findability, accessibility, um, interoperability, and reusability. <laughs> Uh, the current status of the, of the data about UAPs does not meet these standards. The data collection is inconsistent, it's inhomogeneous, it's uncalibrated, the data are poorly documented and largely incomplete. Um, they're also not, not systematically retrievable, which poses a problem in automation of the analysis. So WAP could benefit from data science and machine learning methods, from artificial intelligence that is developing at a rapid pace, but machine learning and AI cannot be applied until the data meet these standards. Even to study a single event currently requires a significant lift in retrieving the data and the metadata that may or may not be available. And this lift is at the moment entirely person power, which means that it cannot be automated to apply machine learning methods. Organized repositories need to exist to enable the automation of retrieval of the data and the metadata, and this is a necessary premise to enable the systematic scientific approach to the study of UAPs. Anomaly detection is a well-developed, although notoriously hard discipline, and which has seen tremendous advances recently with data science and machine learning. Usually, uh, this means detecting rare and unusual signals in a complex that is noisy and rich with phenomena that we know. So there are two general approaches to anomaly detection in the scientific community. One is the following. If we know the signal that we expect, we can model it, and we can simulate it and maybe inject it in our data. <coughs> so we can develop methods that are specific to finding those exact signals or signals that are similar to those. And we might be able to conceptualize signals coming from physical systems that respond to the laws of physics as we know them, but we cannot comprehensively produce all possible signals that could relate to or explain UAPs. 
So the alternative approach in detecting anomalies requires a thorough and deep understanding of what is normal and usual to tease out what is unusual and unlike the rest. These methods typically fall in the realm of what we call unsupervised machine learning. Uh, what is usual may be the balloons, the aircrafts, and a wealth of natural phenomena that we have heard of. And what is unusual, what is an anomaly, means anything in that is not consistent with the way in which those things look in our data. Once the anomalous signal is detected, it can be studied in more depth, either through the discovery data itself, but that may not be sufficient. So then we may need to collect additional data for, to study these, um, these anomalies. And this is something that in astrophysics we typically refer to as follow-up data. This can be very hard, especially if the phenomena that are anomalous are also <coughs> ephemeral in time. So you have to promptly respond to the detection and set up follow-up observations. It's an extremely hard game, but it's something that is seeing a large development in astrophysics in recent years with the study of anomalous detections in the universe. This approach relies entirely on a comprehensive and systematic organization of the data, which is paramount, and on a deep understanding of all the data that is actually usual and known. The data that we might want to collect ideally will be collected in a multi-sensor and multi-platform and multi-site manner. Eyewitnesses reports, I want to elevate what Dr. Drake said, cannot ascertain the nature of UAPs. However, they should be considered because they may contain important information, for example, persistent sighting locations or seasonality. But they only really work if joined with quantitative data um, collected by sensors as well as biophysical and psychophysical assessments of the witness and the impact that the experience has on them to really reveal the nature of UAPs. Um, you heard it from, a from my colleagues a number of times. Uh, the data needs to be collected by sensors that need to be calibrated or calibratable. So we need to collect not only the data, images, sounds, spectral characterization of what we see, but metadata, the sensor type, the brand, the brand of the sensor, the noise characteristics, time of the acquisition, instrument sensitivity, as well as information about the um, circumstances of the data collection, for example, temperature or the location, uh, or the conditions in which the, sen the sensor is at the time of collecting the data. The data should be collected simultaneously by different platforms, ideally, ideally in different locations in a multi-sensor system. So some of the data that we may want to collect are images, but also temperature, sound recording, spectral data emissivity that tells you the color in a very fine grid, um, as well as um, other, as well as uh, monitoring the motion of objects, which has been very important to identify what we have seen as UAPs that have been reported. Much of this certainly can be achieved with professional grade infrastructure and both new and existing infrastructure uh, to do that, such as astrophysical and geographical observatories, both on the ground and satellites. Uh, some modern observatories in particular are designed for the detection of time anomalies specifically, as well as for the detection of objects that move rapidly in space, near Earth objects, asteroids, meteors, etc. So those could be leveraged for the study of UAPs. There is also some effort in, uh, ongoing in the developing of facilities that are specifically to detect, uh, designed to detect UAPs, and many of those comply with the characteristics that I just described. This level of information, though, can also be obtained by the public. Uh, we could crowdsource the data collection if a platform to crowdsource uh, exists that supports the collection of data and metadata and the transmission of data and metadata. And we think that NASA might be able to play an important role in the development of this platform. Um, to echo what uh, Dr. Bontempi said, NASA has a wealth of experience in coordinating scientific studies, efforts across discipline and domains, serving as a bridge between communities in the interdisciplinary studies and studies across um, different countries. All of these can be supported uh, all of these can be leveraged uh, to support the work of uh, the other agencies in the identification and, exp and explaining, explaining UAPs. Uh, NASA also has a really uh, important experience in data curation. We have heard about the sophistication of the analysis of the data that NASA provides, of the um, sophistication of the calibration that the data that NASA shares um, uh, arrives to. 
We have heard about the open data policy um, that NASA data goes under. Furthermore, NASA has recently spearheaded an effort to review NASA and NASA partner archival data to prepare them for machine learning and AI so that data can be served to the community directly and ready to apply AI methods on it. This is an important experience that could be leveraged in the study of UAPs. However, we do want to emphasize that the current status of the UAP data will make this lift really hard compared to even what is being done by NASA for astrophysical data. And finally, I wanted to emphasize what my colleague said. NASA has a great visibility. UAPs are of great, power, of great public interest. And this could be an opportunity to really increase the reach of science, help people understand the scientific process, and maybe diversify the scientific community by attracting new talent uh, into the scientific community uh, due to the visibility of the problem. And I think that's all of my remarks. Questions? Lots of questions. Do you want to go, Reggie? Okay. So uh, on the whole crowdsourcing front and getting uh, reports from citizen scientists, uh, what are you thinking along those lines? Is it uh, providing a set of guidelines for how you report? Is it uh, open sourcing a set of applications for cell phones to be able to pull in a lot of the right metadata? Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, I think guidance would uh, just a set of guidance um, of um, best practices, et cetera, would just not be sufficient. I think what needs to be provided is a platform. Uh, you mentioned cell phones. Cell phones have been used for um, crowdsourcing, the study and detection of a number of things in astrophysics, um, in space science. So that can definitely be done. Um, the issue, I think, is going to be to make sure that this platform is um, that this platform reaches a large enough community to really have a crowd to source the problem and coordination. Something that this could achieve, for example, is uh, the follow-up that I mentioned earlier. Right. So we need this con community that would use. Um, the crowdsourcing facilities to be connected so that if something is cited by one person, uh, that message can go across and a broader community can point their sensors um, to the problem, to the sighting. And uh, the data has to be transmitted to the, that has to be transmitted to a place that can centralize it and curate it. Yeah, please feel free to say this is a bad idea. But if you thought about synthetic data, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, given the fact we don't have enough quality data yeah. to train a, net, a neural net, if we were to generate synthetic data based on the information we do have and then filling out the other characteristics, as we might guess, yeah. does that then help us train something to iterate in AI to be able to find other correlations within data as we get it? So we do it all the time in data science, right? We do generate data sets where the data sets are sparse or scarce, and we cannot train machine learning models. It's a risky business because in the data that we generate, we embed the bias that we have. So we embed our thinking about the data, the way in which we think the data looks, and the way in which we think the anomalies look. So particularly in anomaly detection, it is a very um, difficult thing to do um, to try to make sure that you don't bias your models to what you know. My name is David Grinspoon. I'm a planetary scientist and astrobiologist. And I'm going to talk for uh, just a couple of minutes about um, how observations beyond Earth are relevant to um, our uh, study of UAPs. Um, many of NASA's missions are, at least in part, focused on answering the question of whether life exists beyond Earth. Astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. Uh, as part of this, we consider how to search for biosignatures, observations we can make of other planets which may, might betray the presence of life. So we look for things like uh, anomalous gases in the atmospheres of planets and other anomalies which may possibly reveal the presence of life. When we discover such an anomaly, we don't conclude that we've discovered life. We seek more data to understand what we're seeing, and often this leads to other new discoveries. Similarly, we can talk about looking for technosignatures, observations we can make which might reveal the presence of technological activity somewhere else. 
NASA is also supporting some research studying technosignatures. While there is at present no evidence we're aware of suggesting an extraterrestrial source for UAPs, these existing NASA programs are relevant to the question of UAPs in at least two ways. First, researchers in astrobiology and SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, have focused for many years on techniques and methods for identifying anomalous signatures and determining if they have mundane natural explanations as opposed to revealing unknown biological or even technological activity. The SETI community has expertise and methodologies for determining whether a potential techno signature is in fact a natural phenomenon or misinterpreted terrestrial technology. When a possible techno signature is observed, we ask, is it a real signal? Is it a known or unknown natural phenomenon? Must it be technological? Uh, is it known terrestrial technology? So these scientific communities have relevant experience in determining and communicating about whether observations which first appear to reveal extraordinary evidence actually justify making extraordinary claims. Second, if we do acknowledge an extraterrestrial source, however unlikely, as one possibility for UAPs, then these objects must have traveled through the solar system to get here. Uh, within the scientific community, there's a widespread, but by no means universal belief that there are extraterrestrial civilizations. And we have a well-developed rationale uh, and there's a lot of literature for discussing this, which I, I won't go into now uh, in the interest of brevity, but it has to do with the vast numbers of exoplanets and the, the time scales of evolution and the possibility of convergent evolution on different planets leading to somewhat similar outcomes. And it's a fascinating subject, but uh, the, the relevant point here is that the same rationale which su support, supports the idea that extraterrestrial extraterrestrial civilizations may exist and may be detectable also supports the idea that finding extraterrestrial artifacts in our own solar system is at least plausible. NASA is the lead agency for solar system exploration. It already has an active program of detecting objects in our solar neighborhood using both ground-based and space-based facilities and it could leverage those capabilities to search for objects in space with anomalous motion, anomalous trajectories, uh, unusual light curves, uh, anomalous spectral signatures, or other characteristics. Uh, most of the solar system has not been searched for artifacts or anomalies, and these modest data analysis efforts could potentially be applied to existing and planned planetary missions. Uh, the galaxy does not stop at the edge of the solar system, and the solar system does not stop at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. It's all a continuum of possibilities worthy of investigation. If NASA applies the same rigorous methodology toward UAPs that it applies to the study of possible life elsewhere, then we stand to learn something new and interesting, whatever the ultimate explanation is of those phenomena. And that's all I wanted to say right now. Well, we have time for uh, one or two comments or questions or thoughts. Yeah, um, thank you for that. You know, it struck me while you were speaking um, about biosignatures that we do a lot of that type of analysis, right, in our home planet in, in different capacities. And so it's more of a comment, but I wondered your thoughts on, you know, bringing together those communities that might not work together and whether that would aid in, you know, um, not only establishing what's normal, but you know, enabling the detection or maybe the understanding explanation of a UAP if reported? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the focus of my talk was, was observations elsewhere. But in fact, most of what the field of astrobiology has to study is here on Earth, because after all, it's our one example of an inhabited planet, and it's a little bit easier to get to to make observations. So yes, uh, any, any insights you have uh, in, in that area or any, any suggestions for uh, for uh, collaboration between those communities uh, would, be, would be very valuable. So, of course, uh, NASA hasn't been 
researching the techno signature field for very long and there's been a stigma with techno signatures for many decades. Are there any lessons learned we can impose from the techno signature and the SETI community to the UAP and solar system studies? That's a really good question. Um, I guess the, the immediate thought it sparks in me is that, um, yeah, techno signatures were kind of tr treated, uh, at, kept at arm's length for a long time by NASA because of stigma um, and ultimately uh, can't be kept away forever if you're, if you are an agency, curiosity driven, trying to understand the whole universe, you have to move beyond stigmas and just try to honestly look at whatever evidence there is. And so I think in that broad sense, the same lesson ought to apply to UAPs. Um, as someone who has been working in uh, astrobiology and data sciences for some time now, um, it strikes me uh, when both Dr. Bianco and you talked that the differences that seem to me between biosignatures and te technosignatures fields and the UAP field, again, relies on the data. So biosignatures and technosignatures, they have uh, very uh, well standardized data sets. They have collect been collecting data sets for some time. Um, and they are able to apply machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms, while it's a totally different question with the UAPs in how we can apply artificial intelligence here. So again, just like Dr. Bianca, how she said, uh, it's about uh, data standardization. So um, I hope that the UAP field will learn how to work with the data from the biosignatures and technosignatures fields. So. Yeah, that's a good point. The one, the one uh, point I'd push back on a little bit is whether uh, Techno Signatures has, been, has a lot of data in that sense. It, the, the one part of Techno Signatures, which is looking for signals from radio and optical and that sort of thing that's been you know, associated with SETI for a long time, you're right, there's a lot of data there that we've been collecting. But the term Techno Signatures is sort of newly being adopted, and it, uh, in a way, it reminds me of the distinction we heard um, from the FAA about a cooperative and you know, non-cooperative. Uh, that, that with technosignatures, we're looking, um, there's more of an emphasis on finding um, technology that is not necessarily intended to signal <coughs> us, but just sort of uh, doing what technology does and finding ways to, you know, so it's not looking for signals as much. And in that domain, we have not necessarily been collecting information for that long. But, but your, your point is well taken that there are lessons learned from uh, certainly the astrobiology and the, the sort of classical SETI field where we've had a lot of data and we could uh, look at how that is analyzed and try to collect the data for UAPs that will be amenable to that same sort of analysis. Hello everybody, I'm Carlin Toner. I'm an aerospace engineer. You know, it really struck me when Dr. Drake opened up this afternoon and talked about this really small needle in a really big haystack that we're looking for. And I'm going to talk to you about reporting, a theme that we've heard a lot. How can we make that haystack smaller and that needle bigger? So reporting of UAP events has received a lot of attention recently, but I think that there are still barriers for people to report. How or where should they report? Will someone take action on their report? Will the reporter be believed or will they be shamed? We've heard over the course of our fact finding that many scientists and aviators consider the study of UAPs to be fringe at best. So this suggests there's a significant negative stigma associated with reporting or even researching such phenomena. That said, by encouraging military aviators to disclose anomalies that they've seen or detected, the Department of Defense is receiving many more reports. I think in the time that we've been looking at this topic, growing from an ODII report that was something like 500 to I think this morning we heard something like 800 now, so that's accelerating. And DOD will soon also mandate, if not already, reporting by pilots, <coughs> which will even grow that set. I would propose to this panel that NASA can help make it safer for researchers to explore data in the civil airspace domain simply by starting that work internally. NASA could look at how civil anomaly data is shared, study how to incentivize reporting, 
assess the possibility of crowdsourcing data, which I think we've heard a bit about this afternoon, or sponsor and participate in conferences on UAP detection. Our team has really only seen, I'd say, a few unclassified images of UAP, which lack the contextual data that's needed to understand their true nature. And I believe we've heard a single firsthand account from a former military aviator. So one of my colleagues, Josh, has an example to show just why it would be important for NASA to also sh help shape how the data and information is reported. But before I turn the mic over to Josh, I want to make a recommendation to my fellow panelists that we consider advising NASA to more fully assess the cultural and social barriers to studying and reporting UAP, and for NASA to implement a plan to leverage its brand image to start removing these obstacles. So it's not, it's not the charge of our panel to evaluate UAP evidence, uh, but part of our statement of task is to assess the scientific analysis techniques uh, that are available. You don't have to start it just yet. And the, um, and how we might use them to determine physical constraints on UAP. Uh, you know, the UAP reports with the most detailed contextual information are the ones from the Navy aviators, uh, and they're using a com combination of, um, of ranging and uh, infrared imaging information. And for these cases, we can directly calculate critical parameters of a UAP, uh, such as altitude and velocity, under certain assumptions. Uh, and it's you know, the main point I want to make here is that there, this multi-sensor approach is absolutely critical to um, charting a path forward for UAP investigations, and that pertains to NASA as well. So I'm going to provide one example here just to illustrate the crucial role of science and scientific analysis, um, and the role of scientific analysis to avoid misinterpretation in some sense. Um, next build. Just hit space. Yeah, okay, so this is, um, this video was recorded by um, pilots deployed from the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt in 2015. Uh, the example has been given the nickname Go Fast because it gives an impression of an object moving very rapidly against the ocean surface. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the question is, is this impression correct? And, uh, you know, if not, what can we say quantitatively about what that object is doing in uh, kind of Earth-centered coordinate system? Uh, Fortunately, the information needed to determine the altitude and velocity of this object is contained on the display. So go ahead and next. And uh, this includes the uh, elevation angle of the camera, um, the uh, azimuth angle of the camera, the target range in nautical miles, aircraft altitude, uh, the time reference in seconds, indicated airspeed in knots. Um, you know, this information in this video in particular has been discussed quite a bit on the, on the web. Um, so let's begin with the object altitude. Next, please. So knowing the jet's altitude and the bearing uh, to the target, we can apply basic trigonometry to figure out where that object is in altitude space. And it uh, turns out to be, you know, provided the range information is accurate, which uh, can have some uncertainties associated with it, but the object appears to be at about 13,000 feet. An important aspect of this here is that it's sort of midway between the, uh, the jet and the ocean. Uh, so it's the ocean that looks like it's right behind it is actually 4.2 miles away. And this is our first indication that some or most of the motion that we observe, the apparent motion of the object, uh, is in fact due to the rapid motion of the sensing platform, which is about 430 miles per hour in this case. Uh, but we don't have to guess about this. So we have enough information on this display to actually reconstruct um, the encounter. Go to the next slide, please. And uh, so this is what this is. This is using additional information on the screen, including the time axis. And um, so we know that this aircraft is banking about 15 degrees left, and you can compute through a simple calculator the radius, approximate radius of curvature of the flight. 
And um, you, the bottom line is, I won't go into detail here, but if you can get the bearing and range to the target at two locations with known separation in time, you can figure out how far it moved. And in this case, this object moved about 390 meters um, in 22 seconds, and that corresponds to a velocity of just 40 miles per hour. And so that's a velocity that's consistent with wind speeds at 13,000 feet. So it's not our task to conjecture what this object is, um, but it's an example that illustrates the type of data needed to determine critical parameters that will help us identify such ob objects going forward. Um, in addition to the importance of quantitative analysis, this example also serves to illustrate the kind of cognitive bias we have to contend with uh, for UAPs recorded <laughs> from unfamiliar perspectives. And uh, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick showed another example of that. This is, um, this is a parallax effect case. Thanks. That was, that was actually very helpful for everyone, I'm sure. Um, just one piece of clarification on the video that we showed, the second one that was the new, newly released one, had the three uh, aircraft in it. Uh, the question was asked about if it was a stabilized background against which the jitter was showing. I, I, I am not 100% certain of that answer. It might just be a bunch of dust on that sensor, but let me go back and get you a more fulsome answer. It is either stabilized background or it's just garbage, but in either event, the three aircraft are um, jittering because of the platform. But that's another example of exactly what you're saying, right? It's the perception of the of the operator who thinks it's doing something else when it's actually just your own camera. Right. Yeah, Thank if I you. could just, Sean, in your event, it seemed to me that the, what you mean by jitter in this case is the, the plane is actually making motions that are causing a parallax. So it's actually m more than that. Uh, so the plane will move, and that'll cause the parallax that you just showed. But the sensor itself, the, a lot of these cameras are in gimbals. Mm -hmm. For those of you not certain what a gimbal is, it's the thing that your, your cameras sit on, your telescopes sit on, it moves it around in, in different directions. Uh, those can sometimes be stabilized, in which case they, they uh, mm. damp out the motion of the platform. And in other cases, they're not, and they, they jump around. And so what you're actually seeing in that video is what we call jitter of the sensor against the platform. So the platform's moving, and the sensor is moving. It's not a stabilized against the target. But the, once it's collected, sometimes in processing, the background is stabilized frame to frame, just like some of those TikTok videos you see, right? Same idea. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here. I think uh, make a couple of comments to just follow up on what uh, Josh said in my experience of flying, you know, over 15,000 hours, 30-something years uh, in airplanes and, and both in space. And the environment that we fly in, space or, you know, an atmospheric flight, very, very conducive to optical illusions. So I get it why these pilots would look at that go fast video and think it was going really, really fast. Um, I remember one time I was flying in the warning areas off of uh, Virginia Beach military operating area there. And my Rio thought, the guy that sits in the back of the Tomcat, was convinced we flew by a UFO. So I didn't see it. We turned around. We went to go look at it. It turns out it was Bart Simpson, a balloon. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, oftentimes in space, I would see things, and I was like, oh, that's really not behaving like it should. It's not, it doesn't have the trajectory of a satellite or a planet on the back of the star field. And every single time, when I would look at it long enough, I would realize that it was atmospheric lensing. It was the fact that what, what I was looking at was actually flying behind the atmosphere, and because of variations in the atmosphere, it made the trajectory look like it wasn't going in a straight line. It was going like this, and it would go like that, and it would turn in the other direction. Always was always the case. My brother, uh, Mark Kelly, a uh, former NASA astronaut, and uh, also now a U.S. senator, I was with him for dinner last night, and he shared a story with me again that he had shared years ago, but I had kind of forgotten about it, and I think it's worth sharing. And that, that is, when he was the commander of SDS-124, I think it was, in 2008, they were getting ready to close the payload bay doors of the space shuttle. And 
before they do that, you got to make sure nothing interferes with the doors because if the doors don't close properly, the space shuttle can't re-enter the atmosphere. It would come apart. It's part of the structural integrity of the vehicle. So they see something in the payload bay and they thought it was a tool, maybe a bolt. They couldn't quite figure it out. They were potentially going to have to go and do a spacewalk to retrieve it. But before they did that, my brother grabbed a camera, they took a picture of it, and when they blew up the picture, they realized that this is not a bolt or a tool in the payload bay. It was actually the International Space Station. That was 80 miles away. I mean, that's just a really good example of how this environment we operate in is so, so conducive to op optical illusions. Oftentimes, guys fly into the water. I mean, there are cases where you know, pilots have rendezvoused on a buoy because they thought that was their wingman. It's just very, very um, challenging environment to work in, especially at night. And in my experience, the sensors kind of have the same issues as the, you know, the people's eyeballs. So per what Scott just said, I think we need to take it as an action to investigate unidentified animated phenomena <laughs> to go after Bart Simpson. I, I think what Josh and Scott said is very, very helpful and shows why we need multiple sources of data. Were there radar hits? Were there other sightings? Unless we can look at this from a holistic perspective, it's very difficult to draw conclusions. And relative to stigma, and I appreciate the reports that our colleagues gave, I think there's plenty of stigma right here in this building, and I'm sure, Dan, you've suffered from it uh, at times. <laughs> And I just want to commend Administrator, although he's always be Senator Nelson to me, for his leadership and candidly courage in getting the asset to tackle this issue. And as we look at what Sean had articulated, that what he wants NASA to do, as we look at the recommendations for reporting and how we need to collate that reporting, I'm very concerned that this could be effectively done on an ad hoc basis. And I've been a part of far too many panels and studies that end up sitting on the shelf. I don't want this to be one of those exercises. And we can discuss this further, but I would call for and recommend a permanent office within NASA to support this activity, albeit likely a modest one, but to collate this information, to collate that data, to archive the information, and act as the open, forward-facing counterpart to Sean and AARO. I think then we could continue and actually accomplish the reporting, the stigma issues that have been raised, and we could do so in a relatively affordable fashion. Uh, because again, I don't want all of our work to end up being in vain. Um, I took it upon myself in preparing for today's meeting to draft a statement that answers the eight questions uh, that we were provided um, at the beginning of the uh, last summer when the, the panel was, was created. Um, so I'm going to read the question out loud. I'm going to read my statement and I'm going to pause and let you think and reflect. And if there's, remember, this isn't all of the details associated with each of these answers, right? This is to be a kind of high level, make sure we've got the major points there. Um, and, and this is an initial take <laughs> for, for these answers. So the first question goes, what types of scientific data currently collected and archived by NASA or other civilian government entities should be synthesized and analyzed prior uh, to potentially shed light on the nature and origins of UAP? So the panel reviewed data sources, analytic tools, data architectures from NASA, NOAA, FAA, Commerce, and others. Um, the data that we uh, recognize were not collected for the purpose of identifying UAP, which leaves bias in the data that was collected. Um, even though there is an immense amount of data available, it is hard to access, and the sensors that were used were not well calibrated for um, identifying anomalous phenomena. No questions. Moving forward. Question number two, I kind of feel like Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. what, what types of scientific data currently collected and held by nonprofits and companies should be synthesized and analyzed to potentially shed light on the nature and origins of UAP? 
Many organizations exist to track sightings of anomalous phenomena in the Earth's atmosphere, both nonprofit, for profit, and otherwise. The study panel concluded that much of the inputs collected by these organizations are not considered scientific data in nature and that they do not contain unbiased information, they're not repeatable, and they typically come with uh, eyewitness accounts, which we've heard even today um, that there's uh, hesitations with using only eyewitness accounts to recognize <laughs> or identify UAP. Um, to the point about commercial or companies, uh, there are a lot of space companies that um, some lobbied hard to get in to present to us. Uh, they have troves of data, but they're collected for a variety of different purposes than the purpose of UAP. And those systems, while they are well calibrated, are only one source of many that could be used. Um, and questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Carlin. I'll, I'll bite on that one, Jen. Um, you know, I, I think your answer is correct as to what we've seen, but where I would go is if we made a recommendation to NASA that, you know, we're really asking them to build a roadmap, and we haven't done a robust cataloging. We, we've looked at sources, mentioned sources that we think might be relevant, but perhaps a more robust effort cataloging would be a good modest start. That's good. I, I, I will only in slight defense of trying to answer the exact question as posed <laughs> to the panel rather than trying to add recommendations at this point. But yes, point well taken. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the data sets that we just learned about, you know, heard more about today and thinking about sort of calibrating things is the FAA data on anomalous, uh, you know, tracking events, right? And I think this is something where if we had, you know, some, uh, Imaging software, people, you know, cell, citizen scientists with cell phone cameras identify some event that looks interesting. One of the places you'd like to be able to turn is the FAA data. And having, um, you know, if there is to go back to, you know, having a NASA uh, responsibility for data, NASA might, just, you know, ha has a lot of experience in serving as a clearinghouse for data from across the government for civilian data, right? This is something we do in lots of different areas. And I, I think there are some opportunities with data sets there. And I think the, the radar data is one that comes to mind as one we don't want to forget about as an available data set. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question three, uh, I think, goes more towards the recommendations of what other types of scientific data should be collected. Uh, by NASA to enhance the potential for developing an understanding of the nature and origins of UAP. So we've heard um, now from two of the panelists on some of the information that should be collected um, or the way that some of that data should be organized in a manner to make it available for people to uh, analyze that information. Um, and the only other thoughts that I had uh, here was, was really recognizing the difference in um, the sensor thresholds, right? So we can't always tune a sensor all the way to the resolution that we might need or we might want. Um, and, and as we collect that data to recognize for the scientists that are doing um, those analyses, to the bounds of each of the systems that they're, that they're using. Yeah. You know, what strikes me on that one um, when you were reading the, the answer, the proposed answer, was um, what may be new may be something that's new to NASA in the sense of like a time series mm -hmm. so we can know what's normal, so we can perhaps identify what's not normal or anomalous, right? So I'm not sure to what extent um, it's like the most unsexy thing to sell on the face of the planet, right, is making consistent long-term observations. But I think that the agency may be set up to do just that for mm -hmm. multiple reasons, right? Yeah. Persistent yeah. data collection. The agency does that in a lot of cases for astrophysical purposes. So mm -hmm. the infrastructure, of course, you know, pointing up and pointing at a different distance, but the infrastructure for collecting this kind of data, organizing mm -hmm. and keeping it, and that does exist. Yeah. And uh, there are in their defense, a lot of satellite companies um, that are doing that persistent collection as well. Okay. 
Uh, question four, which scientific analysis techniques currently in production could be employed to assess the nature and origins of UAP? Which types of analysis techniques should be developed? So this is a two-part with what exists today and what should be, so we're looking also at recommendations. Um, based on the information provided by the presenters to the panel, there are very few credible analysis techni techniques available uh, that currently exist um, to assess the nature and origins of UAP. Uh, the onset of artificial intelligence and automated analysis techniques give promise to being able to do that in the future. Um, I wanted to add something to that perhaps, which is that really to design the analysis, you need to know what the data looks like, right? Yes. So, um, you know, we can't really say what kind of analysis should be uh, created on the hypothetical data that we're recommending should be collected in, a, in, a, in some, you know, right. somewhat specified fashion. It, if it's all hypothetical and we want right. to collect all of this data and we know what format it's going to be in, we can design analysis techniques around it. And at that point, it's likely that there are analysis techniques that are that already exist. There Absolutely. There is a wealth of anomaly detection work. Mm -hmm. We just don't know which one will be most suitable because the data as it should be doesn't exist yet. Correct. She said exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, and that, that's what I was getting at with my point. Not that the, those analysis techniques don't exist in the scientific community, just that they're not being applied to this problem set right now, and it's hard to apply them when we don't have the, the known data of what would go into those. David? Yeah, I, I think something we want to stress here is the importance of uniform data yes. and the way it's collected, because particularly when you're looking for outliers, if you have data coming from many different observing techniques, right, and just having a uniform set of <laughs> cameras, a uniform set of detectors, so you understand and characterize them, right, because this is a, a needle in the haystack problem, and, you know, Every camera, I mean, I'd mentioned in the uh, opening se session, ghosting and optics. Yes. Now, that's going to be different in every different detector, every different, right? And you, um, before we get to the analysis techniques, we want to make sure we design the data collection so that the analysis techniques can effectively be used on it. Right. David, can I take a slight issue with that, which is, it sounds like you're implying that you need a single way of collecting the data. I'd argue it's really you need to understand the various ways in which you're collecting the data and you're able to cross calibrate across those different approaches. Because uh, I seriously doubt that there is a single detector. I, I, I think a handful of ways so that you're yeah. um, well characterized. Things, things need to be well characterized to be yeah. useful, I guess is the, the way I would state it. And, uh, it takes time and, and energy to well characterize things, so that, that's, that's, I think, the challenge. So following up on both your points, I think it's where we can actually apply artificial intelligence. So we cannot apply artificial intelligence on the current data, but we can apply artificial intelligence in a way that we can design characteristics for the data that we need and how we can collect the data that we need. So. This is probably more of a frustration than anything else, so I don't know how helpful it'll be, but I think we're not looking for a needle in a haystack. We're looking for anomaly in a haystack. We don't even know that we're looking for a needle. That <laughs> It's just a discolored I, piece of hay. Well, <laughs> I'm from Montana, so I love good hay analogy. I don't know what the phenomenology is that we're looking for. We say anomalous. Again, this question earlier, what does that mean? Anomalous acceleration? Like, I think as we try to look at the data, we're starting from an almost impossible position when if we don't know what we're looking for, is it a radiation signature? Is it something electromagnetic? Is it something like that is why this is so challenging and frustrating to me that we're talking about monitoring something that we don't even know what we're supposed to monitor. And let me just offer, Josh, before you jump in, the, the scientific process of hypothesis-driven research, right? Of that while we don't know all of the possible outcomes in the entire world, we can ask very specific questions and go about it in a very scientific process to understand. So you're right, we don't know exactly what we're looking for, but we know hotspots, as we've seen from both FAA and Arrow, 
Um, we do know some of those conditions that we might be looking for. So if you start with, with kind of what you know or, or places to start to go and look, and you start with the data that we have available to us, we might start be, being able to untangle the chicken and egg problem. Jen, what is the phenomena that we're looking for? So we've heard them from Sean. <laughs> I would pull up Sean's chart, but I can't quickly do that. Um, of the criteria that he said on the trends, I use the word criteria, he said trends, of six or seven um, uh, phenomena, I guess, of specific size or within a specific motion range. Um, and it's something different than what we've seen before, it's something we don't recognize. And so when you go to look for something that you don't recognize, it, it, it can be pretty easy in that we've fooled ourselves today and even watching some of these videos of what's going on. Um, but when you're able to corroborate that with three or four other sources, it starts to make sense. Right? So something that looks like magic to the naked eye or to that camera and that sensor um, isn't once you understand all of the effects of what was going on in the surrounding environment. So what kind of question? Can we, because um, I got the same frustration you do, right? It's, it's regardless of um, uh, what you're looking for, if you don't know what it is, whether you're using AI or match filtering techniques, you can't find it, right? You can't find it. So because the question I have is can we use social media, that kind of thing as a way of queuing um, to know where something's happening? Because we know Google searches can lead you to better understand where um, outbreaks happen, right? Disease outbreaks. Can you use similar type of conflation of data to start saying, well, something's going on here. Let's start queuing sensors in that area, that requires some real-time capability, but is that something we can think about? Can I object to that just a bit? Uh, I, you can find things that you don't know how they look. Okay. There, there is a, a lot of the algorithms in anomaly detection are really based on let's, know, let's find out how what we know looks like so that anything that doesn't look like that can be identified and spotted, and then we can think well, whether or not fair. we understand that's it, right? Fair. And so I that's think fair. the point about the homogeneous detectors really is about that. We need to have a solid understanding of the normal to detect the anomalous or the outliers, as we sometimes perhaps more often call them in, in, in science, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to be cautious of time. We were supposed to end this about 10 minutes ago. Right, so but this has drifted into We've, discussion, but I think we're doing discussion. So do you have any last topic you want to hit? If not, then we'll just open up to general discussion. I have four more questions that we're technically supposed to answer. All right, let's do <laughs> one. <laughs> we can and do we'll, four questions in two minutes, right? Four okay, two minutes. Okay, speed round. Yeah. Fast. In considering all of the factors above, what basic physical constraints can be placed on the nature and origins of UAP. Mike, would you like to take this question? Absolutely. Needle in the haystack. <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, I, uh, in my, my notes to answer this, knew that Sean had presented some trends, so I, I used that kind of as the basis for um, what basic physical constraints could be available, um, and also the Josh's presentation that he just presented of, we know some of these are still in the realm of understanding. We just haven't applied basic physics to understand what's there, what we have. Uh, question six, what civilian airspace data related to UAPs have been collected by government agencies and are available for analysis to A, inform efforts to better understand the nature and origins of UAPs, and B, determine the risk of UAPs to the national airspace. Um, so we saw some of this in, I'm gonna use examples from today to kind of move quickly. Um, some of this in Mike Free's presentation, uh, talking about the, the air risks, right, that FAA is, is always looking out for. Um, we know um, by altitude and by sensor and curvature of the earth and line of sight, and as you get higher that you can see more, right? So we have a lot of civilian airspace data that can start to understand um, the nor nature and origins of the UAP, and determining the risk um, is based on how much you know, right? So you think about, I, I, I go straight to space and I think about satellites and one, um, 
tiny piece of space debris can destroy an entire satellite because they're moving really, really fast in, in the vacuum of space. Um, it's not necessarily so true in airspace, right? Um, but something that we don't know could have a severe impact on pilots and their flight plan and all of that, um, which then could really uh, wreak havoc on all of <laughs> all of the United States airspace. Um, and so being able to understand and identify what those are phenomena are um, will help de-risk the, the air flight safety the, in the national airspace. Um, question seven. What current reporting protocols and air traffic management data acquisition systems can be modified to acquire additional data on past and future UAPs? Um, we've heard a lot of the reporting structures It was talked about earlier today. Um, those probably can be adapted and, and improved, and it's up to us in discussion as the panel on what those recommendations might be. Um, question eight, and I'll get off stage. What potential enhancements to the future air traffic management development efforts can be recommended to acquire data concerning future reported UAPs to assist in the effort to better understand the nature and origins of the UAPs? Um, the potential enhancements, uh, automatic filtering of the knowns has come up as a talking point. Um, these are uh, specific really to acquiring data, um, the tuning of those sensor platforms, the multimodal spectrum collection, um, and being able to kind of timestamp or geostamp each of those to, to corroborate um, the, the sightings. So I will leave the panel with that with time to continue discussion. If you know the properties of hay very well, and you can ca you go through your haystack and say, I don't know what this is, but it doesn't look like hay. You don't need to have a match filter looking for a needle in a haystack if you know hay very well. And who said NASA couldn't speak to Middle America? Uh, <laughs> now, as a New York City resident, my impression is if you go through hay, with your, you don't want to do it with your hands. <laughs> but I, I defer to you on, uh, yeah. I have no choice, but would be good. Yeah, I think AIML, yeah. So um, I want to, in the, the final minutes we have here before the public session, look to the future. I think a lot of us have looked at the data we have now with a sense of dissatisfaction and say, what data would you want and how would you want to collect it? Um, and just think about, you know, we don't need to design the detectors, but think about the characterization that we'd, we'd like, what wavelengths we'd like, and, you know, just to, to kind of throw that out as a, uh, one way to think about uh, w what we might want to recommend. Paul. So one thing that strikes me in that question is that I'm not totally certain that we've dedicated our time and effort to looking for anomalies. I think by default there are some science communities that look for things like um, uh, the genesis of a hurricane or a harmful algal bloom in the ocean or you know something in interstellar space. But I, I'm not sure we ever focused our interdisciplinary effort on that. And I think the question you ask is a really interesting one part of our statement of task, right? But I'm not sure I can answer that mm -hmm. quite yet. That's how I feel about that one. Sure. Shelley Wright. Um, yeah, going along with uh, Dr. Bontempi's point there, we heard a lot from Arrow about specifics about the needle, one to four meters in size, zero to Mach 2. You can then look at NASA's assets, right, and look at its uh, spatial resolution, its spectral resolution, um, in particular, the frame rate to get, to, I'm gonna get to your uh, question here, um, Dr. Spurgle. You can look at the current NASA assets and try to say which ones could find that needle, the ones that uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick put forward. That analysis has not been done. So one of my recommendations would be for NASA to convene a group and a task force to look at its current assets to calculate what current available data, current, 
data, and current facilities could answer insight into that. Now, to get to your future question, looking at this, I see Walter, is um, frame rate. I see a really big issue with frame rate. So if you want to catch fast moving objects, you need to take quick images. If you want to get to these very small sizes and resolution, depending on altitude, where you're, actual, you're taking your image from ground or space, uh, NASA will likely have to increase its frame rate into its detectors. I think a short answer to what NASA's current assets would be able to see would be really big haystacks that are moving very slowly, which I think is the point that you're making. Um, but that doesn't mean that that data is not useful because if it's able to characterize the background extremely well, that gives you a better idea of what unusual looks like. Basically, anything that you do that characterizes the background will contribute to an understanding. Uh, I am Karen Fox with NASA's Office of Communications, and we are segueing into the public Q&A portion of this meeting. Uh, as a reminder, this is a FACA meeting, that is a Federal Advisory Committee Act, and so we are under guidance which says that these meetings are public and that we take public uh, questions. Uh, we got hundreds and hundreds of questions, and I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everybody who, who submitted them. Uh, we're obviously not going to get to all of them today, but we are going to make attempts to answer some of them online. You can always check back to science.nasa.gov slash UAP, where over time we will make it clear where we're putting out some more of those answers. Uh, in the meantime, we did have to make some decisions. Uh, we stuck to questions that applied to this independent study and UAPs. There were a lot of questions about astrobiology and other subjects that we're not going to get to today. And also, in an attempt to get to as many of the questions as possible, since so many of them were similar, we've, we've sort of bucketed them. Uh, and that is how we're going to try to address as many as possible. So I'm going to toss the questions to you, and we'll, and we'll look to getting some answers for our, for our public questions. All right. So first set of questions um, are specifically about the, the data being used. So examples, what exactly are you incorporating into your report? What data are we using? What are some examples of data being used? Do we have multi-sensor data or of objects performing maneuvers that seem truly anomalous? Do we have photos, videos? What about having the NASA historian go through the NASA's historical records? Did you interview military or pilots for this study? So looking for some information about the kinds of data. I can toss to anyone. David looks like he's jumping yeah. in. Well, I think first and foremost, our goal here is really to create a roadmap, right? So really, um, you know, we have been informed by some of the events that are reported, and we've had, uh, but we've certainly not done a complete historical study in, our, in an archive. And I think one of the things we've wanted to do was learn what kinds of events have been reported, learn about some of the ones that have been resolved, some of the ones that are unresolved, so we can th best think about how in the future we can collect data so that we can get more robust answers. So that, I hope that, that addressed that question. It does. Uh, other, others have anything else they'd like to add? All right, then I will keep going. Uh, another big question category was about transparency and about sharing information. And so examples in this category are, what is NASA hiding and where are you hiding it? How much has been shared publicly? Has NASA ever cut the live NASA TV feed away from something? Has NASA released all UAP evidence it has ever received? What about NASA astronauts? Do they have an NDA or clearance that does not allow them to speak about UAP sightings? <laughs> what are the science overlords hiding? Dan Evans. All right, I'll take a stab at that one. That one. I really want to assure the public and to double down on some remarks I made this morning that this agency is absolutely cast iron committed to openness and transparency and honesty. And that commitment also extends uh, to our live NASA TV feeds. They provide real-time footage from our various missions. Now, to my knowledge, NASA has never intentionally cut a live feed 
to hide anything, and that includes UAPs, of course. Um, sometimes there are interruptions to our feeds, but that is simply because space is a complex place. There's a vast array of natural phenomena, human-made objects, and so forth. Um, but again, I wanted to reassure the public that we're absolutely committed to providing the public transparency and openness. Those are the hallmarks of NASA. That's why we're here today in public on TV, because we want the public to have the opportunity to see the process of this committee doing its work in public. It's only right. Just to, to follow up on what I, what I said, I, I didn't mean to, be, to joke about it, but in my 20 years at NASA, no one, either officially or unofficially, in my recollection, have ever discussed or briefed us or had any kind of discussions about anything that would be considered a UAP or UFO or anything like that. And I'll ask you to stand for one second and state your name. I'll ask you to stand for one second and state your name just so everybody know okay. who was yeah. speaking. It's hard sorry, to see Scott in the back. Kelly. I'm just following up on, uh, on the, the question about if NASA astronauts ever signed an NDA or um, anything of that, um, anything like that. Um, in my experience of being in the astronaut office for 20 years, there was never any formal or informal discussions at all about UAPs or UFOs or anyone reporting anything that would suggest something from, you know, beyond our planet. Thank you very much. Yes, please. I just want to make a quick comment about the, the culture of science uh, in relation to this question. Uh, scientists uh, by nature are, are, are uh, at least intellectually sort of rebellious. It's, it's, it's in our nature to question authority, you know. Uh, uh, that's how you're a good scientist. You don't just take someone's word for it. You try to uh, discover the truth. And for that reason, uh, you know, this question about what are the science overlords hiding, that's sort of written in a facetious way. But I, I just want to emphasize that uh, th there's no way that all, that all scientists could be in on, 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 on trying to hide something because it's, it's just not in our nature. If somebody told me to try to hide something as a scientist, that would just increase my uh, desire to, uh, to, re to belay that order <laughs> and, and, and to release it. And I think that's true of, of uh, our, our community in general. All right. Thank you so much. I am going to go on to our third set of questions, um, which is, has NASA been tracking Earth's atmosphere, or are we also studying bodies of water for, for UAP? And I think that's a Dan question a for NASA, question. or? Is that a me oh. question? Yep. Yep. Oh. Here's the oceanographer. Um, uh, so, you know, my understanding is this is a completely independent study to assess you know, what assets, what data, um, what science, what observations, platforms NASA has to potentially help evaluate and understand uh, UAP, right? We have, um, well, NASA has an Earth Science Division and many scientists at many centers and many academics and other partners out there um, that study the Earth as a system. Um, we do this from the unique vantage point of space and the atmosphere is part of that. Um, so uh, I think Dr. Kirkpatrick stated this morning that to his knowledge and I think to ours, there, there isn't anything that's been reported below the ocean surface, um, you know, and so I think part of what we've been talking about all day is, you know, what assets are out there to actually begin to um, identify data that could be useful in explaining any of these reports if and should they come in. So I think that's probably it, unless there's something else to add. All right, then, thank you. Moving on to our fourth general bucket of questions. Uh, what are you doing to solve the stigmatization surrounding the study of UAP? I can take that one. And state your name if you wouldn't mind first. Carlin Toner, FAA. Um, I think the fact that NASA has called us together here as a panel to look into this, that NASA is hosting a public meeting, that we've heard Right, it clearly stated we're here to be transparent. I think that's the first step in trying to 
really normalize the study of UAPs. And, I, you know, we talked a little bit earlier um, about the reporting, about how to make it credible. And we talked also about UAP um, in one of the earlier talks this morning of, of <coughs> the definition of the A, whether it was air, um, aerial or anomalous, as the legislation now is, and really the distinction beyond UFOs, right? When we're looking at UAPs here, we're beyond just airplanes. We're, we're looking at all types of anomalous phenomena. Um, and so that's just a more inclusive term there. Yeah, still Mike Gold. Um, just wanted to emphasize what uh, Carlin said, which is so accurate. I, I really consider it quite amazing that we're here having this discussion. As the leadership deserves great kudos for this. And beyond, I think a recommendation that I'd like to make is that NASA participate in symposia, in panels, sponsor research. When you have the NASA logo on that sponsored research, on the discussion, it really helps normalize and push back against the stigma. I think NASA can leverage its excellent reputation, both domestically and abroad, to help push back on that stigma. And I think it's important to do so not just for science and discovery, but for national security. That we've all seen what's occurred with balloons from rival nations. We don't want this stigma to be a vulnerability that rival nations can take advantage of. Yes, Dan? Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Just a, a few additional points um, from you know, the agency perspective. We are, of course, taking a set of actions to effectively normalize the study of UAPs. And that involves collaborating across the government, encouraging an open dialogue, and promoting rigorous scientific inquiry. Um, let me turn to each of those in turn. So in terms of promoting a rigorous uh, scientific inquiry, the primary way we're doing this is by being truly rigorous and employing an evidence-based methodology in everything that we do. That is characteristic of scientific research. It's no accident that the people up on this stage are true experts in their respective fields. Okay, So that is in turn going to help us to legitimize UAP studies. Encouraging open dialogue. So by holding public meetings such as this one, and having open conversations about findings, then we're helping to normalize discussions again. And that, that really goes arm in arm with our commitment to openness and transparency with the public. And then finally, in terms of collaborating across the government, we're working very closely with other government agencies, not least Sean's office, Aero, uh, to broaden the scope and the depth of our study. And I honestly believe that this collective interagency approach will lend credibility to the study of UAPs. And it's going to demonstrate the seriousness with which we're approaching this issue. Thanks. Well, that uh, segues very nicely into what our next set of questions are, which is uh, who we are working with. So the question is, who else is NASA currently working with or do we want to work with to study UAP? And is NASA working with international partners? Pete, do you want to do it? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Okay. Um, as the questions tasked to this panel so kindly asked us, um, both in what other government agencies um, are collecting data, what data is available, NASA is partnering with them um, in, in many ways, as well as uh, national ha NASA has a, a wide commercial outreach um, and partnerships with understanding what data is available, um, as well as NASA is founded on, on, well, not founded, but it, the core principles of, of NASA are with international partners. Um, so the information that our partners are, are gathering is, is typically available to NASA as well. So, Michael, yes, on all accounts. And I may just emphasize and add that NASA is singular, I believe, among government agencies and its international outreach. Again, not to keep talking about the Artemis Accords, but you see countries like Saudi Arabia that we may not have a great relationship with as government right now. We have Saudi Arabia and Israel in the Accords family, so that NASA is unique in its scope and ability to reach out. I also think that we're entering a new era of commercial space transportation that is going from low Earth orbit out to cislunar space. And that is going to be the purview of the Department of Commerce, which is taking over space traffic management. So I think it's very important that NASA work with and support commerce as we go through that transition. Department of Defense is currently responsible for that. 
And I think that will help us not only to identify potential UAPs, but to assist in preventing contention, congestion, and eventually conflict. And I also want to note, in terms of space debris, debris in orbit right now, I believe, represents an existential threat to our very society, that we are getting very close to an event that could cause real problems for our ability to access satellites. And that's why I think there's great ancillary benefits to the conversation we're having today, that as we increase our capability to monitor orbit for UAPs, that data could also be very relevant as we look at near-Earth objects and other threats. And again, to just end on near-Earth objects, Apophis, for example, an asteroid, is going to come so close to Earth, it will be below geosynchronous satellites. So any effort to begin to catalog and do better in terms of understanding that environment is going to be terrific, and I hope NASA works with commerce and international agencies on Apophis and other missions. I think Federica had something to say, uh, too. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, a lot of the things that we think we might recommend in terms of platforms to collect data that would be useful to study UAPs, you know, we recommend a multi-platform and multi-site. That would also mean likely ground-based as well as space-based facilities. Um, and this is being done already in astrophysics, co-observing the sky uh, from the ground and from space with different methodologies and different, uh, different instruments to get a more comprehensive picture of what's normal and then detect what's anomalous. And um, about every 10 years, the scientific, the astrophysics community anyways, but many other branches, uh, convene a panel of experts to see what things can be done to advance um, the, the field in the next decade. It's called the Decada Survey for us. And one of the recommendations this year was explicitly for agencies that do astrophysics to work together. So, NSF, DOE, and NASA to work together, share data, share facilities and instruments. So I think this is, um, you know, it, there's uh, a lot of um, fields will benefit from this, including the UAP studies. Oh, absolutely. Carlin Toner, I, I'd like to put an exclamation point on how well NASA is collaborating across the government. I can, I'm from the FAA, and I can personally attest that you know, FAA and NASA have a robust uh, engagement in transferring research um, into practice in the ATM system. I think on the commercial space side, we work well with NASA. And, and all of our agencies are in the whole of government approach, uh, supporting Aero specifically on the UAP topic. And, and you know, it really comes down to good government and how we deliver because we can each work our own mission space, but to cover the whole space, we need to collaborate together. And Dan? To put an exclamation point on Carlin's exclamation point. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's important to say that you know we really do have a, a good relationship with the Automain Anomaly Resolution Office, Aero, Sean's office, um, and its previous or predecessor organization, the OAP Task Force, uh, and we have really benefited from very fruitful collaborations uh, among those various entities. And quite frankly, as as a taxpayer, one should expect nothing less than the government to be working effectively across different units together. It's only right. Um, that being said, it's also important to acknowledge what NASA's perspective is in this study uh, and to acknowledge that you know, the, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community have, have massively different equities about the study of UAP uh, and they have different interests. Ours is a purely scientific one. So you know, we collaborate, we consult. It's a very good relationship. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with Carlin that a whole of government approach is absolutely the right one to take. Great, thank you. I will uh, move on to our sixth bucket of questions, uh, which we had many on this topic. Uh, is there evidence that UAP were created from non-human intelligence? All right. Yes, please. I will take this one. Um, first and foremost, we are scientists, and we follow the scientific process, and um, I hope that uh, the gathering here today uh, showed a little bit of a glimpse on how the scientific process works. Um, it's not a question that you can answer very quickly with yes or no, um, and uh, we follow the data, right? So um, as scientists, we follow the data, we formulate hypotheses, we test theories, we follow the scientific process. The role of this panel has been to create a roadmap and a framework for how 
all scientists that are interested in this phenomenon uh, can further study, can further collect data, can further um, formulate experiments, uh, again, hypotheses, can test different methods, maybe even innovate on the methodology side of things, uh, come up with new methods for how we can do basically science, but not just any kind of science, but the science of discovery and exploration, uh, which is basically in uh, the spirit uh, of NASA. Uh, so just like Carl Sagan was saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, we cannot make that kind of extraordinary claims um, at all for any kind of big subjects in science, whether it's UAPs, whether it's biosignatures, whether it's technosignatures. This question of whether we are alone in the universe is probably one of the largest questions that we've had in our history of science, in our history of humanity. And it's not one that we can take lightly. And that's why we need so many scientists and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams to work together and many organizations. Um, so it's a process, it's a roadmap, and we work collectively on this. And uh, we hope that within our lifetime, we will be able to answer this big question of whether we are alone or not, and also to better characterize this phenomenon, which is UAPs. So. I want to sort of supplement that excellent answer by noting that we have not seen the extraordinary evidence, right? That, that, I mean, it's in a sense, to give, you know, to make the claim that we see something that is evidence of, you know, uh, non-human intelligence it would be or would require extraordinary evidence and we have not seen that i think that's important to make clear all right then i will move on to our seventh set of questions we received many questions about the budget that is being uh dedicated to this uh how large of a budget will nasa allocate how large of a budget is nasa allocating and how large of a budget will nasa allocate towards this, the study of UAPs. Dan. Yeah, that's a Dan question. So there, there are two separate questions in there, which is what is the budget for this group, this team, and what is the budget going forward, I think. Now, the budget for this independent study team is, is very consistent with any other of our external review groups that we bring in to the science mission directorate on an annual basis. So you know, we have maybe 100, 200 such groups entirely consistent with that. Also important to say going forward now that NASA has not established a program relative to UAP. And as a result, there's no associated programmatic funding, but this is how NASA works. Federal budgeting is, is a complex uh, journey, of course, and the way NASA, particularly NASA science likes to work is we anticipate and wait recommendations from independent groups such as this one and we need to wait on final recommendations and, and then we'll make an assessment. So too early to say, but of course that's all couched in the fact that federal budgeting is a very complex process and we will always follow the law. All right, uh, we're making good time. We have uh, one more question that, that encompassed many of the ones we got, uh, which is, has NASA encountered any aliens or extraterrestrial life? What happens if the public comes across extraterrestrial life? What would NASA do if extraterrestrial life was discovered? What would NASA study or do if extraterrestrial life was discovered? Now, I, I think it's worth making a distinction that there, when we talk about extraterrestrial life, we do have a study within NASA of astrobiology, which is not intelligent life necessarily. And so I invite you as you answer this question to make clear the distinctions as you are talking um, uh, in terms of UAPs as well as uh, any astrobiology work that we do. I would start by saying one of NASA's big questions is, is there life out there? Right, and a lot of what NASA is doing in its exploration of the solar system and beyond is focused on searching for life in any form, extraterrestrial life. Um, I think one of the things we have learned in the past 20 years is planets are common. We knew, of course, about the planets in our solar system, but we now know there are lots of planets out there, so there are lots of potential environments for life. And I think uh, 
one of the most fascinating questions is, do any of those planets host life? And that's uh, something that NASA is trying to address in a host of different ways, whether it's probes uh, that are landing on planets or designing missions that will look for signatures of life around other planets. So the search for life is a really important theme. We haven't found life beyond Earth yet. Right? I mean, let's be clear about this. We haven't found it yet. But we're looking, and we're looking for it in lots of different ways. And, you know, David was discussing techno signatures as one way that we can look both within our solar system and beyond. And there's, so there's a lot, a lot of different elements, I think, of this potential search. And, um, you know, just to go back to something so that was phrased in an earlier question, you know, is NASA hiding anything about this? No. This is actually what, you know, answering this question is one of the things that NASA as an agency is, is excited about. It's what's something that lots of scientists working with NASA are excited about is, is this question of, uh, is there life out there? You know, and I think one of the things that makes this question of are we alone such a central question, not just to the scientific community, it's a central question, I think, for the public. Um, I suspect there are more people watching this than the typical episode of NASA TV, right? And this is something where we will have, me you know, media coming to the press conference because these questions touch on something that I think is really a deep question for humanity is, are we alone in the universe? Uh, yeah, it just to uh, kind of echo what David said a bit, I mean, obviously this is something uh, we think a lot about in astrobiology. What, you know, what if we succeed? Um, and, uh, you know, we are very driven uh, to try to find uh, real, evidence of extraterrestrial life. And um, we would be highly driven to share that if we found it, um, because everyone wants to show that they've been able to succeed in what they're trying to do. And, and you know, one perhaps illustrative example is to think about what happened when we came close, when NASA thought maybe they had discovered extraterrestrial life. And, and um, a big event, actually, in the history of astrobiology was in, in the 1990s when some scientists had thought that they had discovered fossils in a meteorite that came from Mars. Um, and what happens is you don't announce it immediately. You make sure that you try to make sure you're right because you don't, also don't want to have false alarms and announce something where and then you go, oops, sorry, we were wrong. That was a mistaken analysis. But what happened was when the when the scientists were sure they were right, then um, there was a big, um, in fact, presidential press conference with President Clinton and NASA, and it was a big public announcement. And um, that's what would happen. If we discovered something, we would try to make sure we were right, and then we would very proudly and loudly let the public know about it. Thanks. We have just one minute left, so I'll let you finish up. Yeah, thank you. Um, the only thing I wanted to add, I wouldn't at all liken it to um, alien or extraterrestrial life, but in astrobiology and exobiology, you know, there is the exploration of our planet as an analog for what might be found on other worlds, um, you know, and what, what is extreme cold, what is extreme heat, um, a volcano, a black smoker at the bottom of the ocean, what lives there and how is that even possible? And things we still discover throughout our ocean might look alien to a lot of people, right? Um, and we keep discovering new species of different things, whether they be microbes or algae or, you know, charismatic megafauna, whatever they are. Um, but there are synergies. Uh, I know there was an initiative years ago at NASA called Oceans Across the Solar System, and the idea was could our own Earth's ocean be used and the life within it as an analog for what might be discovered elsewhere. So I think that's an example of a potential synergy of interdisciplinary science, research, observations, et cetera, collection of data and information gathering that could be useful in the future. Thank you all so much. I will hand it back to David Spurgel, your chair. So let me also just answer the one other piece of that question was 
what do you do if you see something surprising? Right? Where do you report? And this is something where, just to come back to something I mentioned in my opening remarks, the AARO is the, our lead agency for UAPs. And while we've talked about origin, you know, life in this context, most UAPs, I think when one, and when one looks at the data in more detail, are going to turn out to be phenomena we understand. We saw this with some of the balloons or, or commercial jets. We saw those examples. Some UAPs, and we saw this with the Chinese balloon that flew over, is something, an issue sometimes of national security. So we actually do want to encourage people just from that angle to report it. So, you know, uh, since, uh, so before, we'll transition to summary, but I just want to answer on, the, on that question, that, you know, to keep in mind that, um, you know, the AARO's role is to be the prime source for understanding those things. And what our charge is, is to think about what's NASA's role. And I think NASA, you know, and this is something, you know, we'll con I want to now go back to discussion. We didn't have that much time for it. Just to, th to come back to, you know, what we each, you know, what we see as NASA's role in this. Um, I think one role piece we've talked about is be uh, NASA can help remove the stigma. NASA can draw m more of the scientific community in. And I think what NASA could help do is provide standards of high data quality. I think one of the things that um, many of us who've come, you know, not looked at this before, I certainly put myself in this group, was struck by the limited nature of the data, that many events had uh, insufficient data, and that in order to get a better understanding, we will need to have, you know, high quality data, data where we understand its provenance, data from multiple sensors. And I think one of the things that, uh, you know, even from the same sensor, as we saw, you know, in Josh's analysis, you know, also in the event Sean showed us, when you can observe event over time and get velocity information, that gives you a lot of additional information. So we're gonna want things with high frame rate, we're going to want things from multiple perspectives. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think those are all going to be pieces of things that we want to think about. Um, I think this is an opportunity um, for citizen science. I think if uh, we can come up with recommendations in, in our roadmap that point to ways in which we could collect it, people can collect data. I remain a big fan of these things. They do take over our lives too much, but they are um, fabulous data collectors of, and I don't know, there's something like three, four billion of them that are on the planet. And NASA, I think, has the prestige and visibility to develop uh, an app or work with companies to develop apps that could collect data in a uniform and centralized way um, that I think will, you know, most of the stuff that's collected is going to turn out to be commercial planes, balloons. Uh, when you have multiple cameras, you can eliminate some of the optical limitations of the ghosting and those effects. Um, some of them will almost certainly be novel physical phenomena, right? I think. It is, uh, we have learned a lot about our planet and how the universe works. There's a lot we don't know, right? I think, yeah, you know, as, as scientists, what is the most exciting thing is the surprises. And I think that there are things that continue to surprise us about our own planet. There's phenomena in our atmosphere, in the ionosphere, that we probably haven't seen yet. Or perhaps we've seen and not noticed yet, right? And there's, I, I think, a, a long history in science when you look back and you realize that this in discovery had a pre-discovery. So people had seen something before and were missing it. And 
those pre-discoveries were not of note, be often because we had biases against seeing it, but often because there was limitations in data quality. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was taught is uh, when you have a question you don't know how to answer, you start by getting better data. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we're coming, you know, I get to do the summary, and as the chair, I get to, you know, summarize a conclusion. And um, we need better data, would be my, my takeaway. And we need more uniform data. And since I'm so proud of my haystack, <laughs> we need to be able to understand what's in the haystack. And it's a lot more complicated than a haystack, in a sense. Right, is you know, it's got commercial planes, it's got you know drones, and you know I think uh, the number of drones out there is large and growing, and will be a continual source of confusion. Um, we were charged to think about air safety, you know, understanding and characterizing, seeing what's going on with drones is also I think going to be an important air safety issue. Um, so we'll need to, uh, you know, to understand the unknown or to start to study the unknown. Uh, another important piece is always going to be characterizing the known really well. And, um, you know, this is the part, I think, of a lot of science that seems dry and boring, but it's calibration and understanding the events you expect to see. Um, you know, in thinking about this area, uh, one of the, the groups of people that you know, people talk to are particle physicists doing experiments at CERN, where they go through the effort of finding extremely rare events to find new particles. And in order to do that, you need to understand the standard predictions well. So I think another part of the whole story and I know this is something AARO is working hard on in the context of military. It's like you've got to characterize what you, the known things are. You know, when you've got that F-35 flying past a balloon, what does it see? What does it see at sunset? What does it see at odd observing angles? And that characterizing the normal is an essential thing to do to understand what's out there. So let me conclude the session by thanking the panelists. It's been a pleasure learning from you. Thanking our, uh, Sean and, and, and our other invited speakers and our, our, that we've had. We've had some, for our, uh, some of our data collection sessions. Uh, we've learned a tremendous amount from you. And also thank the public for their engagement. I think we were all impressed by the, the number and level and sophistication of the questions people sent in. We tried to address as many as them that we could in the session. Uh, as you heard, NASA, uh, through science.nasa.gov, will provide, there'll be some additional answers provided. I encourage you to go there. Uh, actually, as a non-NASA employee, I'll put in a little ad for science.nasa.gov. NASA does amazing things, and we're learning amazing things about the universe and our planet, and just encourage you to go there and uh, continue to learn and continue to explore. So thank you all.